Well, I want to welcome everybody to uh, the uh, NVER Econometric Methods Lecture. Um, my name is Andrew Lowe. I'm going to be talking about financial econometrics in action, analyzing hedge funds and systemic risk. The uh, other econometric methods lectures uh, in this series have gone through a variety of techniques uh, for uh, various aspects of uh, financial analysis. What I'm going to try to do in the next uh, two lectures is to focus on uh, a very specific set of econometric issues that come up in dealing with hedge funds. Now, you might think that hedge funds are a relatively narrow focus. And in fact, uh, if you take a look at the industry, hedge funds are a pretty small uh, amount of the assets under management in the financial industry. But uh, as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, that's uh, a little misleading because hedge funds end up being far more active in the way that they invest. And so while they are using a relatively small amount of assets relative to all of the financial assets that are out there, they use it in a very active manner, much more so than typical uh, traditional investment vehicles. And so they have an inordinate amount of influence in the financial system. And so for that reason, they're worthy of study. But there'll be lots of other motivations that I'm going to provide uh, over the next uh, few minutes. So the focus uh, of my talk will be on the following uh, topics. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, first some very basic facts about hedge funds. I'm assuming that uh, not all of you are familiar with what they are, what they do. Um, and then I'm going to turn to some basic properties of hedge fund returns uh, and also focus on their risks and in particular uh, the liquidity aspects of hedge funds. That's one of the biggest issues regarding the hedge fund industry is their impact both good and bad, on uh, market liquidity. Then we'll take a break. And in the second part of this uh, lecture, I'm going to focus on hedge funds and systemic risk. And in particular, try to understand what role they might have played uh, in the past financial crisis, but more importantly, what uh, role they will play on an ongoing basis, and how we might develop some econometric uh, methods for understanding the impact on the uh, broader economy. So. Uh, with that as a basic introduction, let me begin by uh, defining some very basic facts about hedge funds. And for each of the sections and topics that I'm going to cover, I'm going to list a few readings uh, at the very start, just so that you can get your hands uh, you know, into the uh, material in a somewhat more accessible way. Um, much of the comments that I'm going to be making today are based upon uh, research that I've done with uh, some uh, students and colleagues. Uh, they've been summarized in a book that I uh, published last year, uh, Hedge Funds and Analytic Perspective, but you can get much of it from the literature, and I give you examples of it uh, in each of the uh, uh, sections. Obviously, the literature on hedge funds is much, much larger, and um, I will dispense with the literature review, so I apologize in advance if I leave out citations from anybody uh, here, uh, but certainly uh, the citations uh, in the book and in these papers are considerably more complete, so I would uh, urge you to take a look at those as well. Now, I suspect that um, a number of you have now heard of hedge funds, but you may not know what they are. And I have to say that there's a lot of controversy, even in the industry, with regard to how to define a hedge fund. Some skeptics would argue that the term hedge fund is misleading uh, because what it really refers to is a compensation scheme as opposed to a separate uh, industry or a set of entities. And you know, there is a bit of truth to that in the sense that hedge funds operate differently in terms of how they compensate their managers uh, from how uh, typical mutual funds or uh, long-only investment vehicles uh, compensate uh, their managers. In fact, the, the most uh, uh, cynical definition uh, came from somebody years ago who uh, told me what his favorite definition of a hedge fund was. And uh, it went something like this. At the time, I didn't really appreciate it. Um, he said that um, a hedge fund is a partnership with a general partner and a set of limited partners. And it's a finite uh, partnership that has a beginning and an end. At the beginning of the partnership, the limited partners bring money to the partnership and the general partner brings experience to the partnership. And uh, at the end of the partnership, the general manager leaves with all the money and the limited partners leave with all the experience. So that's a little bit uh, cynical. Uh, and it wasn't until I understood a little bit more about hedge funds that I finally understood that joke. Uh, 
but the idea is um, that, that hedge funds uh, engage in a, a host of strategies by the limited partner, uh, by the uh, general partner, based on money that is provided by the limited partners. And because they are unregulated investment companies, they can engage in all sorts of risky strategies that are unconstrained. So you can think of hedge funds as mutual funds on steroids. They are very active. In fact, some would argue that they are hyperactive uh, in the types of trading uh, and strategies that they engage in. Um, because they are unregulated, they do have some prohibitions as to who they can take on as limited partners. Typically, hedge funds are not accessible to the general public. Uh, they are not a retail product, although that's changing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the industry later. Uh, historically, hedge funds cater to uh, qualified investors, and the term qualified uh, is really a uh, regulatory definition. It, it essentially amounts to investors that uh, have a certain minimum level of net worth so that they can afford to take the kind of risks that uh, an unregulated entity represents. Also, hedge funds uh, have a very different fee structure, as I alluded to at the very beginning. Hedge funds uh, typically have a fixed fee, a fixed in terms of a percentage of assets under management, typically 2%, uh, although that varies between 1 and 2. Um, and then, most commonly, they have an incentive fee, uh, typically 20%, although that's also variable uh, in some cases, uh, much higher, in some cases, a bit lower. So this 2 and 20 structure differentiates hedge funds from, say, typical mutual funds that only charge uh, a, a percentage of assets under management. The very first hedge fund uh, was started by a fellow by the name of Alfred Winslow Jones in 1949. And the way that the name came about was that uh, Alfred Winslow Jones engaged in both long positions as well as short positions. And so the idea was that the fund would be um, protected from downward movements in the general market. Uh, it was hedged to some degree. Um, obviously, uh, as we now know, hedge funds can have various kinds of risks, not just market risk. So it's a bit of a misnomer to think of hedge funds as safer. But it is true that for certain kinds of hedge funds, like long short equity or equity market neutral hedge funds, mm -hmm that their volatility tends to be lower than, say, the S&P 500. So uh, that's sort of a bit of a history of how hedge funds came to be. And over the last uh, several years, they've really proliferated, largely because of the ability to take on positions and leverage that uh, really isn't accessible to traditional vehicles. And here's a very simple numerical example. I realize that this may be fairly straightforward for many of you, but uh, let me uh, illustrate anyway just to define some terminology. Suppose you have a typical mutual fund that can only engage in long positions and uh, has a $10 million uh, base of capital. Um, that means that the mutual fund can purchase, say, $10 million of IBM, and therefore if IBM goes up by 10%, the mutual fund makes a million. If IBM goes down by 10%, the mutual fund loses a million. It's relatively straightforward. On the other hand, if a hedge fund has $10 million, it can engage in the following transaction where it can purchase $30 million of IBM and simultaneously short sell $30 million of General Electric for a total gross position of $60 million across these various two assets. And so, obviously, if IBM goes up by 10% and General Electric goes down by 10%, now all of a sudden the hedge fund has made 60% of its uh, capital. And so this is a, an illustration of how hedge funds engage in much riskier strategies because, of course, if IBM goes down by 10 and uh, GE goes up by 10, it's looking at a pretty significant loss. It's hedged in the sense that it's both long and short, so if you think that the S&P is going to impact both GE and IBM uh, prices, um, the hedge fund will not look as volatile. But because of both leverage and going long and short, this particular investment vehicle has risks that the typical long-only investment doesn't. Now, um, let me uh, uh, 
tell you a little bit about the industry and where it stands. Today, there are approximately 10,000 hedge funds worldwide. And um, most of the hedge funds uh, are controlling, in aggregate, about $1.7 trillion. The figure is actually a little bit higher if you include proprietary trading desks at various different broker dealers. This is just hedge fund assets. And the typical fee structure, as I said before, was 2 and 20. And they also have something called a high water mark, which is basically a, a mechanism that tries to align the interests of the hedge fund manager with those of the investor. Given a performance fee that uh, in, in, induces convexity in the payoff structure of hedge funds, you might think that that would induce managers to take on more risk, because heads I win, tails you lose uh, with that performance fee. And so the idea behind a high water mark is to say that you only get to charge that performance fee if you are actually in positive territory with respect to my investment in your fund. So if I put $100 in your fund, and for the last couple of years you've lost money, so now I'm only at $97 uh, relative to my original 100 you can't charge me any incentive fees until and unless you make up that $3 loss. And at that point, you can charge incentive fees above that high water mark. And that high water mark keeps getting set to the high water level over the years as the manager makes more and more money for you. So if the manager ever loses money for you, uh, he can't charge incentive fees uh, until he makes up that loss. Hedge funds, for the most part today, are registered investment advisors. They register with the SEC. Um, that wasn't true as of a few years ago, but as more and more pension funds and institutional investors have gotten interested in hedge funds, they've had to clean up their act, become more uh, institutionally oriented. So now they're registered with the SEC, and the most common legal form is a limited liability corporation, which has many of the benefits of a partnership, uh, but also the benefits of uh, limited liability corporations. Um, the most common uh, financial structure is what's known as a master feeder structure. The idea is that um, hedge funds uh, will have a domestic feeder fund that attracts investor assets domestically. They'll have an offshore, typically a Cayman Islands feeder fund that will attract foreign investors. And both of these uh, pools of assets get funneled into a master fund, which is typically a Delaware LP, and then the investment manager manages that pool of assets uh, through a brokerage account. So that's just a quick overview about the typical structure of a hedge fund. And let me mention that, that the hedge fund industry is really a very heterogeneous uh, industry. It's not nearly the kind of uh, you know, homogeneous type of uh, uh, co collection of companies that, say, the mutual fund industry is. Uh, in fact, if you think about the hedge fund industry from the perspective of the various different activities that go on in it, it's really more like 20 or 30 cottage industries. And to give you an example, uh, Credit Suisse Tremont uh, provides uh, indexes uh, of that hedge fund industry. And so they categorize the industry into these various different subgroups. Uh, hedge funds is their main all-encompassing category, but they also have uh, subcategories like convertible bond arbitrage, dedicated short selling, distressed emerging markets, and so on. Each of these categories have a certain amount of heterogeneity even within them. So for example, in the uh, long short equity category, which probably is the single largest category of hedge funds, those represent funds that invest in exchange-traded equities, stocks, uh, long and short. In that category include both fundamental stock pickers, uh, like uh, Eddie Lampert, uh, who will buy and sell stocks uh, based upon fundamental analysis that uh, he and his team of analysts do. But it will also include quantitative managers that use portfolio optimization methods and econometrics to try to come up with long, short equity strategies. So they're very different in nature, but they're both categorized as long, short equity. And uh, by the way, these categorizations don't include a number of other uh, types of uh, private partnerships that uh, some people consider to be part of the uh, alternative investments industry, like private equity, venture capital, real estate, natural resources, and insurance. Uh, so we're going to be focusing today just on uh, what we consider to be the, uh, the hedge fund uh, industry. 
Okay. So let me start with a little bit of motivation. Why should we care about hedge funds? Given that they manage $1.7 trillion, that, that's a relatively small amount of money by traditional mutual fund standards. Uh, for example, I suspect that uh, Fidelity or BGI or State Street uh, have assets far greater than the totality of what seems to be in the hedge fund industry. It turns out that hedge funds are far more important, though, than the $1.7 trillion might suggest for a few reasons. One is that because hedge funds are unregulated, they engage in such a heterogeneous collection of strategies that during normal times, they are the tip of the spear in that they uh, are first to take advantage of new investment opportunities that get created. And similarly, during bad times, they are the canary in the coal mine. They're the first to get hit with any kind of dislocation. So the financial crisis that we experienced over the last two or three years started in 2007, 2008, depending on your perspective. For the hedge fund industry, it began in 2005. Actually, in May of 2005, with the General Motors downgrade, a lot of convertible bond arbitrage managers lost tremendous amounts of money in that month. And thereafter, this location really hit one sector or the other of the hedge fund industry uh, throughout those two years leading up to what we consider to be the start of the financial crisis. The other reason that the hedge funds play an important role is because of leverage and illiquidity. They take on, in some cases, tremendous amounts of leverage. We've heard the stories from uh, LTCM and uh, the most recent uh, uh, debacle with Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. They take on tremendous amounts of leverage and as a result, they have a disproportionate impact on financial markets, far more than the $1.7 trillion would suggest. And because of their investing in illiquid assets, the potential for financial dislocation is pretty significant, as we saw from 1998 in LTCM, but even more so recently with the various different kinds of strategies that have proliferated across the entire uh, financial system. And finally, if you look at who is investing in hedge funds, it used to be the case in 1998 that hedge funds was really a, a well-kept secret, that the kind of investors were relatively uh, experienced, uh, high net worth individuals, family offices, foundations. But over the last 10 years, the kind of investors that you have in hedge funds include funds of funds, central banks, insurance companies, and uh, most uh, importantly, pension funds. Uh, in a minute, I'll explain why most importantly. But this uh, set of investors that uh, now uh, make use of hedge funds is really far broader than it's ever been before. Now, here's a uh, graph of the assets under management in the hedge fund industry. There, you notice that there are two different uh, colored bars, uh, dark blue and light blue. Uh, the difference is that the dark blue is the actual amount of capital, the amount of dollars in the hedge fund industry uh, in that given year. The light blue includes the leverage uh, that uh, uh, is uh, provided to hedge funds by their various counterparties. And you can see that there was a tremendous growth in hedge fund assets after 1998, which hit a peak of close to $6 trillion, about $5.5 trillion uh, in 2007. Obviously, with the financial crisis, that leverage was brought down considerably, and a lot of assets flowed out of the industry. But very quickly, the dislocation uh, worked itself through in the hedge fund industry to the point where now the assets uh, have built up considerably. And actually, this is an outdated graph. As of uh, last month, I believe we've actually surpassed the, uh, the high point of the amount of uh, leveraged assets in the industry. So we, the hedge fund industry is now back to where it was, even at its peak. And that also gives you a sense of why the hedge fund industry is, is so interesting. It's a lot more dynamic than the mutual fund industry in that there's much more turnover. The speed with which firms come into existence and go out of existence is pretty quick. So 2006 and 2007 were years where there were unprecedented number of hedge funds that got shut down because of the dislocation. But 2007, 2008, and into 2009 were periods of unprecedented growth in the startups of hedge funds. So lots of firms coming in and out of the sample, uh, and that really uh, provides lots of uh, interesting uh, opportunities for economists. 
So if you're interested in more of an industry background, I recommend you take a look at a report that was produced uh, in April of 2009 by a pension consulting firm called Casey and Cork. Uh, they produce a report that describes their perspective on the hedge fund industry. They, they allocate money on behalf of their clients to hedge funds. And one of the most interesting things that they came up with was where the assets were likely coming from uh, into hedge funds. And they projected that assets, the asset growth over the course of the next five years would be fairly significant. And I think that their projections were, in fact, maybe a bit conservative because we are already at the point where we've surpassed uh, the levels that they uh, had thought would be possible. Uh, down here in the lower right-hand corner uh, is a graph of the inflows of money uh, from various different sources. And you probably can't see it from back there. But if you take a look at the, uh, the hard copy, you'll notice that the single largest source of money into the hedge fund industry is pension funds. Now, there's a reason for that. It's not that pension funds have any great love for hedge funds. In fact, I suspect that there is a, a abiding love-hate relationship between pension funds and hedge funds. As many of you know, pension funds are highly regulated under ERISA and other requirements. And so they have all sorts of reporting and transparency requirements that uh, typical investors in hedge funds don't have. So why would they be allocating money to, pension fund, uh, to, uh, to hedge funds? Well, there's a very simple reason for that, and it has to do with the realities of uh, asset liability management. As most of you know, pension funds, after the last three years, are significantly underwater in terms of their asset liability mismatch. Their assets are now quite a bit lower than their liabilities. And so they've got a lot of lost ground to make up for. And when you do an analysis of the uh, universe of possible investment vehicles and assets, and you're trying to advise typical pension funds that are underwater as to how they are going to make up for lost ground, you come up to the same answer time and again, which is let's put more money in the higher yielding assets. And the higher yielding assets historically has been hedge funds. Now, I don't agree with that calculation completely because obviously historical data can be quite misleading, particularly when the data are so non-stationary. And I'm going to show you some examples of that shortly. But the main non-stationarity is that the hedge fund industry has grown really rapidly over the last two decades. And as a result, the performance characteristics of hedge funds, even 10 years ago, may have very little resemblance to what the performance characteristics are likely to be over the next 10 years. And if we use the past history as our only guide as to how to make investments, we can actually be surprised uh, that uh, things don't work out the way we would like them to. And unfortunately, I think pension funds are being led down this path blindly uh, because they're just drawn uh, to these incredible performance characteristics, which we're going to cover uh, in just a few minutes. I'm going to show you some data that uh, will illustrate why it is that hedge funds just look so irresistible to investors that are looking to make up for some, uh, some lost ground. So um, hedge funds are, in my view, the Galapagos Islands of finance in the sense that they are very dynamic and you can see evolution occurring before your very eyes. Uh, high levels of compensation provide uh, impetus for managers with talent and opportunity to start up hedge funds. And when that compensation goes away because of losses and if you're below the high water mark by a significant margin so you can't charge incentive fees for quite some time, hedge funds get shut down. And the fact that these strategies come into and out of existence rapidly uh, provides a really interesting window into what's going on in the financial industry. So um, with that as the basic motivation and introduction, let me now turn to some uh, uh, basic empirical facts about hedge funds. I want to start by talking about the data, you know, what data are out there. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the data. And then we'll talk a bit about some of the econometric techniques that are most useful for trying to understand that data. So there are a variety of aggregate as well as individual hedge fund data sets. And let me just describe the most popular. From the perspective of the aggregate uh, indexes, um, Credit Suisse Tremont uh, has provided uh, a time series for monthly returns 
of these various different hedge fund categories going back to Jan January of 1994. There are other vendors that provide uh, hedge fund indexes. Uh, HFRI is another popular set of indexes. Uh, Barclay uh, is another uh, set. And these indexes are made up of a weighted average of actual hedge funds. Um, now, these indexes are a little bit different than the traditional indexes that you might think of, like the S&P 500, in the sense that the typical uh, uh, indexes uh, that the long-only world looks at are, for the most part, investable. Meaning that if you look at the S&P 500, for example, and you like the return streams that it seems to be giving you, you can actually put a billion dollars to work in the S&P 500 over the course of the next couple of weeks, and you will get the return on your billion dollars reflected by that index. This is not true of any existing hedge fund indices. So hedge fund indexes are uh, a combination of these existing hedge funds, but many of these hedge funds are limited in the amount of capital they can take in. In fact, some of them are even closed. So while they generate performance numbers month to month, you or I could not easily put a billion dollars to work at any one of them and still expect to get the kind of performance that the indexes reflect. So that's one issue. Another issue has to do with survivorship bias. Uh, the fact that uh, only the survivors are typically included in these indexes, and so uh, you don't necessarily get the same cross-sectional representation that a broad-based index like the S&P 500 gives you. Um, so there's also selection bias, there's backward fill bias, there's all sorts of biases that we can talk about a little bit later on. Uh, but I, I want to alert you to the fact that these indexes are not like uh, the traditional uh, indexes that we're used to uh, seeing. The second source of data uh, is uh, individual hedge funds. And there are, again, several vendors that provide uh, data for uh, individual hedge funds. Uh, the most popular today seems to be TAS. Uh, that's the data set that most of the academics studying hedge funds make use of, although there are other data sets that uh, we've used as well, and I'll describe those in a minute. Um, the nice thing about the TAS database is that it goes back to February of 1977, although the bulk of the hedge funds uh, in that data set didn't really uh, appear until the 1990s. So there are a few hedge funds in the early years, but very, very small relative to the later uh, uh, hedge funds that came into the sample. The interesting thing about the TAS database and about all hedge fund databases is that they are voluntary. And this is an important thing to understand about the data. Hedge funds do not need to report to anybody, unlike publicly listed stocks. If you list on the New York Stock Exchange, your data goes into a database whether you like it or not. And it goes into the database from the first time you start trading till the last day you're listed on the exchange. There's no such database for hedge funds. Hedge funds are not required to report anywhere. So the only reason that you see a hedge fund in a database like TAS is because they want to be in the database. Now, why would they want to be in the database? free advertising. This data is sold to a number of investors. And the investors pay a subscription fee so they get a sense of what investable uh, hedge funds are out there and what their performance characteristics are. What that means is that there's obviously a pretty clear self-selection bias. Um, now, the TAS data is a little bit better than others in the sense that they have what's called a graveyard database. And the graveyard data is exactly what it sounds like. When you're a hedge fund and you list in TAS and you are there for a few years and then you blow up and you decide that you, you're gone and you shut down, that data is not erased from the database altogether. It's moved over into the graveyard database. So the time series of returns that existed when you were alive actually is still kept in that graveyard data. So you can analyze the returns of graveyard funds as well as live funds and you can see the degree to which there's any kind of bias, for example, in the average returns. It turns out there is a bias. And the bias uh, is around three to 400 basis points, depending on which study you look at. Now, you might think that's a really small bias, given the power of selection here. But you also have to keep in mind that in addition to the losers not being in the live database, the really big winners are also not in that database. There are hedge funds that have gotten started and have done so well that they've never needed to advertise in these kind of databases, in which case you won't see them either. 
So there's truncation on the left tail, but there's also truncation on the right tail. Obviously, the left tail is thicker than the right tail. And so there is a little bit of downward or upward bias uh, with this kind of selection process. But it's not nearly as much as you might think. Let me uh, make one final point about the data set, which is that the other vendors that are out there include HFRI. Um, CISDM is a, uh, a center at the UMass Amherst. And they put together uh, a set of data that uh, uh, they provide to academics without charge. Uh, and then MSCI uh, and uh, Eureka are uh, other vendors. Now, there are overlaps among these various data sets, but uh, in a th 2007 study by uh, Bill Fung and David Shea, they actually did the public service of showing the overlap across all of these different data sets. And they found at that time that the, the intersection of all of these data sets was approximately 3% of all of the funds. So there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in terms of which funds are listed in which data. And so when you're doing research, you just want to be aware of that. All of your conclusions have to be caveated with this uh, fact that it, you, what you're looking at may not be fully representative of the industry. So here's some more information about the data. I won't, I won't go through it. I'll let you take a look at it on your own. But this just gives you an idea of the number of hedge funds in the various different data sets how they come into and go out of the data set. And this is the uh, percentage of, of assets under management represented by the different styles of hedge funds. And as I mentioned, the long short equity category uh, typically tends to be uh, a pretty large fraction of the assets under management, representing anywhere from uh, 30 to 40% uh, of, uh, of the assets. Now let me talk about numbers, and then we'll start doing some econometrics. These are summary statistics for the uh, returns, the annualized returns of hedge funds based on monthly data from January 1994 to February of 2009 across the indexes that Credit Suisse Tremont reports. And for comparison, at the very bottom of this table, I've got uh, performance numbers for traditional indexes like the S&P 500, the Russell 3000, and so on. And if you just look at the mean column, uh, the column of average returns, they look fine. I mean, they, in some cases, look good. In other cases, not so good. Uh, distressed investing has a mean return of about 10%. Emerging markets, 75 Global macro, 12.4%. But what makes these numbers really interesting and compelling is the column uh, labeled SD, standard deviation. This is obviously a typical measure of risk for these funds. And when you look at the risks, they tend to be much lower. In some cases, less than half of the volatility of the S&P 500. And so when you take a look at the ratio of mean to standard deviation, uh, that's a kind of a bastardized sharp ratio. Uh, in, in the hedge fund industry, uh, they, they often assume a risk-free rate of zero just for convenience sake. Um, so if you just take a look at the ratio of, of mean to standard deviation, that uh, sharp ratio with a risk-free rate of zero uh, shows that hedge funds actually have quite a bit better risk return characteristics than traditional investments. So for example, distressed investing has a sharp ratio of one and a half. Um, if you look at risk arbitrage, that has a sharp ratio of 1.6. Now take a look at the S&P 500, that has a sharp ratio of 0.4. The Russell 3000 has a sharp ratio of 0.27. So hedge funds, when you look at their risk reward characteristics, far and away beat traditional investments on this basis. Now, of course, we know that this is not the only way to measure risk. And so from an academic perspective, I don't think any of us are fooled into thinking that this is a great investment. But think about a pension plan sponsor that's trying to decide between allocating more money to the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000 or to the JP Morgan bond index or to hedge funds. They're going to be drawn to hedge funds. And maybe they won't allocate a lot initially, but they will allocate more than they have in the past. And so you know, my guess is that over the course of the next five years, we're going to probably see an additional 5 to 10% of total pension fund assets allocated to hedge funds. 5 to 10% of pension fund assets is huge, and that will just overwhelm the industry. So there's going to be some significant developments to come because of these basic numbers. That's one of the reasons, frankly, why 
doing proper econometrics uh, is so critical uh, at this point in time. Um, I just want to say a few more words about the Sharpe ratio because here we get to do a little bit of econometrics and point out an interesting feature of hedge fund returns. So the basic idea behind Sharpe ratios, as all of you know, is take the mean, uh, subtract the risk-free rate, divide by the standard deviation, and then if it's a monthly number, we typically quote Sharpe ratios annually, so you have to annualize, and you multiply by the square root of 12, assuming IID returns. The typical Sharpe ratio for hedge funds ranges from uh, 0.25 to 0.1, to 1, 0.0, if they're relatively liquid. If they're illiquid, it turns out that their uh, Sharpe ratios can actually be quite a bit higher from, 1 .5, from 0.5 to 1.5. And so this really compares quite favorably uh, to traditional investments, uh, but that's only because Sharpe ratio is not a sufficient statistic for measuring the myriad kinds of risks. Now, the, the point of, uh, that I made uh, before about uh, pension funds getting attracted to Sharpe ratios, I think, is highlighted by this little illustration. High Sharpe ratios are extraordinarily difficult to resist from the investor's perspective because it looks like you're getting something for nothing. You're getting higher return and lower risk. Who wouldn't want that? And so it, it's useful for us to spend a little bit of time exploring the econometrics of Sharpe ratios to just ask the question, why do you get sh high Sharpe ratios? Why are some strategies higher Sharpe ratio than others? And while there are a number of reasons that one can come up with, particularly from the uh, underlying economic theory perspective, there are two that I think worth focusing on for now. One is high frequency trading, also known as market making. Uh, and second is illiquidity. Now the third reason is you've got really good information, maybe too good, and it turns out that high sharp ratios can actually be an indicator for insider trading uh, and, uh, and also fraud. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes. But I want to focus on the first two, high frequency trading and illiquid securities. High frequency trading is a, a common buzzword in today's uh, regulatory debate because as we saw from last month, the, uh, the so-called flash crash of uh, May 6th, um, there are real problems when uh, trading happens at a pace faster than the regulations were designed to accommodate. And, but in particular, high frequency trading has a very different risk reward characteristic than traditional investments. And in particular, it, it uh, ends up being extraordinarily attractive from the risk reward perspective, at least on the surface of it, because the kinds of risks that affect market making are what we call tail risk or the black swan or picking up nickels and dimes in front of steamrollers. You know, most of the time it's profitable and every once in a while you get squashed, right? Uh, market making has that characteristic to it. And so strategies that are like that look very profitable. They look very consistent. Low volatility, high expected return until in the parlance of Wall Street you get your face ripped off. So every once in a while you get whacked. And I'll give you an example of that that I think is kind of an interesting and instructive one so you can sort of see how this works. Suppose that you've got a strategy where every single day you either make or lose half a percent on your capital. So it's a coin toss. 0.5% is your profit or your loss. And let's suppose that the probability of winning is 58% the probability of losing is 42%. So it's close to 50-50, but not that close. So that your expected return per day is 8 one hundredths of 1%. And it's got a lot of volatility too, right? Because you're going up or down by 50 basis points where your mean is 8 basis points. So it's uh, you know, got a lot of risk. Suppose the risk-free rate is 1% per year, which is about what it is right now. And suppose that you've got 250 days of independent trials of this particular investment opportunity. Well, if you just calculate the Sharpe ratio, the theoretical Sharpe ratio of this strategy and on an annual basis, what you get is that this has a Sharpe ratio of 2.2. It's an incredibly attractive strategy because you're essentially engaging in time diversification, right? You've got a lot of independent trials, and each trial is profitable by a small margin. You're making nickels and dimes most of the time, and when you put it together, it looks really great. The problem with these kinds of strategies is I've left out the fact that 
more often than not, you are taking other kinds of risk that you don't know about, particularly liquidity shock. So for example, a New York Stock Exchange specialist will be making profits like this on most days. But every once in a while, like October 19th, 1987, you get wiped out because the market is all going one way and you are not making nickels and dimes on that day. If you have to make markets when everybody is going against you, there's a huge adverse selection effect and you will lose. Uh, so the kind of risk profile is potentially misleading because you're using mean and variance as if they were sufficient statistics for risk when in fact they're not. So um, just as a small aside, how do you in conduct inference on sharp ratios? Well, so here's where we get to do a little bit of econometrics. If you assume that the returns are independently and identically distributed, then it turns out that you can work out the asymptotic distribution of the sharp ratio very easily uh, using a first order Taylor approximation. And so here's the distribution of the sharp ratio uh, the standard error looks like this. It, it doesn't look nearly as messy as this equation would have you believe. It's actually just equal to one plus one half the true sharp ratio squared. And so that means that when you estimate a sharp ratio, you should always calculate a standard error. And under the null hypothesis, uh, it's relatively easy to calculate that, um, which is given by right here. If you don't know what the true sharp ratio is, you can assume it's zero. And under the assumption of no performance ability whatsoever, you can calculate the standard error. If you want to assume a little bit of performance, uh, you can obviously make that adjustment. What's more subtle is how we annualize the Sharpe ratio if we calculate it from daily or monthly data. Because the IID assumption tells us just take the square root of the number of periods and multiply, and that's how you annualize. But what if the data are not IID? And for most asset returns that we deal with, like stocks, uh, futures, uh, the serial correlation is pretty small. But it turns out that for hedge funds, serial correlation is actually not so small. So it actually matters how you annualize the Sharpe ratio. Uh, now, if you don't assume IID, it turns out that you can still develop a set of uh, uh, asymptotic results, but you have to do a little bit more work. You have to rely on estimators like the generalized method of moments. So in particular, you can extend these inference results very easily uh, to stationary and ergodic returns, in which case you can uh, get the asymptotic distribution using uh, this uh, very simple GMM framework. Uh, and uh, the way you estimate it you, is using any number of estimators, including the Newey West estimator for the uh, variance covariance matrix. But the interesting thing about uh, this analysis is that for stationary and ergodic returns, it also gives you a different way of annualizing sharp ratios. So in particular, if you're looking at the, the, the returns aggregated across Q periods, so if, you, if you're looking at the variance of a Q period return, uh, you can actually show that the variance of a Q period return is just equal to the sum of all the possible covariances. And when you work out the analytics, you get that the Sharpe ratio of a Q period return is a factor eta times uh, the Sharpe ratio of the single period return. And this eta factor looks like this. It's a function of the number of periods, obviously, in the aggregation interval, but it's also a function of the autocorrelation coefficients. If nothing is autocorrelated, if your returns are IID, then this eta Q just turns out to be the square root of Q. That's what we said before, square root of 12. But if you've got any autocorrelation, then taking the square root is not the right thing to do. You have to take into account the serial correlation. And it turns out that for the strategies that are the most attractive, the ones that have the highest Sharpe ratios, those are the ones that actually have the highest serial correlation too. In fact, we're going to see in a minute that there's a very tight relationship between serial correlation and illiquidity among certain kinds of hedge fund strategies. So anyway, that's just a, a, an econometric uh, aside to illustrate how you might take into account these effects. We're going to come back and talk about why these effects are so important. Let me actually show you some data to that effect. So 
this is um, a set of summary statistics for individual mutual funds and individual hedge funds. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the mutual funds have names on them because I obtained them from public sources. Uh, but the hedge funds do not have any names on them uh, because uh, hedge funds um, are notoriously uh, press shy. Uh, and moreover, uh, hedge fund managers are generally very well funded and litigious. And uh, so they have no qualms about suing people that say certain things about them in the press. So that's why the names uh, have been removed, so as to uh, reduce the uh, possibility of lawsuits. Um, what I want you to focus on here is uh, the column labeled row sub 1. That's just the first order autocorrelation of the monthly returns of these funds. You'll notice that for the mutual funds, the autocorrelations are all pretty low. In fact, the highest number there uh, for the mutual funds is 12.4% for the Fidelity Magellan Fund. The lowest number is minus 4% for the Vanguard 500 Index Trust. There's very little serial correlation among mutual fund monthly returns. And in the last column, you have a p-value for the Box Pierce Q statistic that tests for the statistical significance of the first uh, uh, 12 autocorrelations. And the, the, the smallest p-value is 13%. So no statistical significance in autocorrelation among any of the mutual funds. Now look at the hedge funds. The hedge funds, most of their p-values are well below 5%. Uh, for example, the very first fund, the convertible arbitrage fund, the autocorrelation of the monthly returns is 42.7%. I mean, that is a ridiculous monthly autocorrelation. That's a huge amount of predictability in terms of its prior month's return. Now, we're going to have to talk about that because that's a problem from the perspective of you know, efficient markets, a random walk hypothesis. Well, it shouldn't be there, but it is. And at first, when my co-authors and I looked at this data, we were sure we had a programming error. So we had to go back and redo it three or four times before we were actually convinced that these numbers were correct. They are. They are correct. If you take a look at um, mortgage-backed securities, that's got an autocorrelation of 42%. You look at uh, high-yield debt, 33.7%. Now, if you look at risk arbitrage fund A, that's got an autocorrelation of minus 4.9. Um, risk arbitrage B, same thing, minus 4.9. But convertible arbitrage A is 33.8. So it's all over the map. There's a lot of heterogeneity. And the question is, is there any logic to that? Is there any reason why some funds have really high autocorrelation and others don't? So that's a puzzle that we need to grapple with. And we'll have to start developing a little bit of econometrics there. I'll come back to that. I want to make one other point about the, uh, uh, the data, which is correlations. Hedge funds are attractive not just because of their returns, not just because of their Sharpe ratios, but because they have very attractive diversification benefits. In particular, if you look at the correlation of these hedge fund indexes with traditional indexes like the S&P 500, generally the correlations are no more than 50 or 60 percent, and in some cases they're actually quite a bit lower. So for example, uh, the correlation of, say, um, equity market neutral with the S&P 500, that's only 25%. Uh, in fact, the correlation of managed futures with the S&P 500 is minus 14%. So if you remember from your basic portfolio theory, when you've got something that's got low or even negative correlation, that's really attractive from reducing your risk reward uh, uh, kind of profile, of benefiting. Uh, your uh, uh, mean variance uh, efficient frontier. So the correlations uh, are very important, but something has been happening to the correlations over time. And let me show you a simple example of that. So here's a graph of the correlations among the hedge fund indexes themselves. So not with the S&P 500, but convertible arbitrage with equity market neutral with managed futures. What I've done in this graph is to calculate the correlation matrix uh, for the Credit Suisse Tremont indexes over a 60-month rolling window. And within each 60-month rolling window, when I have that correlation matrix, I'll take the absolute values of those correlations and average them. 
and plot it. So this graph with the, um, the blue line is the average. The red line is the median, as opposed to the mean, of those absolute correlations. And you can see that the mean uh, absolute correlation, um, for the most part in the 1990s and the early 2000s, was in the 42% range. And then it, there was a big jump down. And then since the 19, uh, 2004, uh, it's been creeping up, up, and up. Now, what's going on? Well, first of all, that one jump down ha can be explained by one single data point. And the data point is, of course, August 1998, LTCM. Uh, let me show you what happens to this graph when you take out August 1998. When you take it out, the, the correlation goes way down. So what happened was August 1998, Lots of hedge fund strategies lost money. That created correlation in the estimators. And so if you leave that data in, you get an, uh, an unusually high amount of autocorrelation uh, or cross-correlation until August 1998 drops out of that rolling window. The fact is that hedge funds have an average correlation among themselves of around 35%. But over time, that correlation has continued to creep up, largely because money has poured into the space and therefore, hedge funds are running into each other in terms of the strategies that they're deploying. And financial market linkages have become tighter and tighter over time. So with uh, that correlation caveat in mind, let me now turn to uh, the uh, uh, first aspect of hedge fund performance that I want to focus on, which is their returns, hedge fund returns. And for this, um, I'm going to refer you to an article by Ackerman, McAnally, and Ravenscraft, as well as uh, a, a piece that I did on uh, where do alphas come from. Um, I want to explain a little bit about how to think about hedge fund performance, hedge fund returns. Um, this is loosely related to the uh, investment performance literature, but only loosely related in the sense that we use a, a very different metric than the traditional ones that have been proposed. So first, let me show you what performance is. Um, this is the Credit Suisse uh, Tremont Hedge Fund Index, the cumulative return starting uh, December of 1993. Uh, all of these various different indexes are normalized to be equal to one at that same date. And you can take a look at this graph to see how all of these various different asset classes performed. The really super duper wild swing for this light blue graph, that uh, is uh, oil. And so if we put oil aside, because there was a bit of a roller coaster ride, as we know, from the last few years, the best performing of all of these asset classes is, hands down, the hedge fund industry. Uh, now, there are a lot of problems with that index, as I mentioned earlier. But nevertheless, from the paper uh, perspective, on paper, the hedge fund industry looks like it's performed incredibly well relative to a lot of these other asset classes, including stocks, uh, bonds, currencies, commodities, and, uh, and so on. And so the question is, why? How do hedge funds do what they do? And this goes to a broader question of what do we mean by active management? Typically, when we think of active management from the traditional portfolio management perspective, we're talking about excess performance above and beyond some benchmark. And so active bets in that framework means departures from that particular benchmark, benchmark weights. Uh, benchmarks are considered passive, they're easy to achieve, there's very little skill involved, they've got low fees. And so a traditional measure of active management is the information ratio. This is used more often by industry folks than by academics. Uh, it's basically a, a measure of your alpha per unit tracking error or excess risk. So the idea is that you've got some benchmark and you're taking some additional risk above and beyond that benchmark. That's your active risk. And so what you want to do is to measure the extra expected return that you're getting per unit of that extra risk you're taking above and beyond the benchmark, with the idea that if you're a pension plan sponsor, you could be getting the benchmark return instead of giving your money to this active manager and paying active fees. However, what if there are other systematic factors going on? What if it's the case that 
as with the APT or Merton's inner temporal cap M, there are additional risk factors that generate additional risk premia. You're not measuring it, so therefore those risk premia are lumped into your alpha, and the variability of those extra factors are now lumped into your residual variance. Then how do you think about excess return? You know, we have a situation where your alpha could be risk factors, and so you're attributing to uh, performance what, in fact, should be attributed to risk. So it's really difficult to try to understand how you think about a hedge fund's performance, because a hedge fund is taking on lots of different kinds of risk, not just equity market risk, but currency <coughs> risk, interest rate risk, uh, liquidity risk. So. What we really want to ask is where, where do alphas come from for a hedge fund? And it's, it's a different question in certain respects than for traditional investment vehicles. So let me propose a very simple idea that really strips down the basics of what we mean by investment acumen. If we think to all of the various different kinds of investors that we uh, respect and uh, admire, and we ask the question, why do we respect and admire them? Well, obviously, they make money, right? They, they're, 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 they have market wisdom. But how do we know they have market wisdom? So for example, Warren Buffett is often lauded as this market wizard. The reason that we uh, have so, so much respect for him is because he makes certain bets and moves his portfolio allocation around in order to accommodate those bets. And then those bets turn out to be Correct. That same set of skills apply to any successful investor, no matter what the time horizon is, right? I used to think that Warren Buffett was different from, say, a high frequency uh, trader like uh, Stephen Cohen. Stephen Cohen, for those of you who haven't heard of him, is a legendary uh, day trader. Uh, who came out of a broker-dealer named Gruntle to start SAC Capital. And the, cap, the, the amount of money he's generated for his investors is in the hundreds of billions of dollars at this stage. He makes money like nobody else does on a daily basis, intraday. He trades and is responsible for some ungodly fraction of the New York Stock Exchange volume. He doesn't do it quantitatively, although now his firm, SAC Capital, employs both quantitative managers as well as fundamental uh, analysts. But he himself is literally a screen trader. He will look at the screen 9.30 to 4 o'clock and trade all day. That's all he does. He looks at the prices, picks up the phone, calls people, gets information, trades, and is incredibly profitable. And at first, I thought that Steve Cohen and Warren Buffett were two different animals. Because Warren Buffett, obviously, is no day trader. You know, he trades, what, once or twice a year, uh, if, if that. But it turns out that in both cases, they have a common denominator. And the common denominator is this. They make a decision with regard to their portfolio weights. And subsequently, that decision turns out to be successful. That is, the stocks that they buy tend to go up. The stocks that they sell tend to go down. And it's pretty much as simple as that. So that suggests that investment skill can be measured in terms of the degree to which your decisions lead to good outcomes. It has to do with the relationship between your portfolio weight changes and ultimately the returns to your portfolio. So let me be a little bit more specific. I'm going to argue that active management consists of time varying portfolio weights where the time variation depends upon information. And in particular, using my discrete time notation, the portfolio weights at time t depends upon information at time t minus 1. So in other words, you can't look ahead into the future. When you decide to trade at time t, you're using information up to and including only that as available as of time t. So I write that as x of t minus 1 following the standard conventions uh, of our literature. So the question about active management is, how good is your information, x of t minus 1, in giving you portfolio weights, omega t, that ultimately turn out to be successful, that is, generate returns that are positive? So that's it. All we need to do is to ask the question, 
whether or not these portfolio weights lead to good outcomes. So let me, let me show you what I mean. So uh, this is a standard definition of covariance. I'm going to just use a different form of it. The expectation of the product is equal to the covariance plus the product of the expectations, right? Standard identity. So now let's take a look at this very simple expression. I'm going to take a look at the product of two variables, xt, yt, uh, and I'm going to sum them over t and divide by t. So this is the sample, uh, sample counterpart to this. And what I want to show is that the sample counterpart behaves identically to the population counterpart to this covariance relation, OK? I'm going to use that in a very simple way uh, in just a minute to decompose returns. So let's do this. The return on my portfolio at time t is simply equal to the weights at time t, which were determined using information prior to time t, multiplied by the returns at time t, which I did not know at time t, obviously. These are returns between time t and t plus 1, right? So the expected return on my portfolio is simply equal to the sum of the expected returns of these individual terms, I mean, each of my uh, positions of my portfolio. But this is the expectation of a product. So using my previous identity, I can always write the expectation of a product as the covariance plus the product of expectations. So that means that this expectation of the product is given by this, the covariance between the weights and the returns, and the expectation of the weights times the expectation of the returns. Or it's equal to this. This bottom line is, in my view, a, a summary of active versus passive portfolio management. What this is saying is that your expected return, the sum total of what you expect to earn, is going to come from two pieces. One piece is the average portfolio weights that you're going to hold multiplied by the average return on those assets. Plus, it's going to be augmented by any covariance between your weights and the subsequent returns. Now, look at this covariance. This covariance is interesting because it's a function of information at time t minus 1 covarying with the returns at time t. Effectively, what this is measuring is your ability to come up with good portfolio weights at time t minus 1 that subsequently turn out to yield positive returns the next period. In effect, it's a measure of how good you are at forecasting those returns. And so let's take an example. Suppose that you form your weights randomly. Well, clearly in that case, the covariance between uh, your weights and the returns is 0. So if you're forming weights randomly, then your expected return is going to really come from the average level of those weights and the average risk premium. Or alternatively, suppose you never change the weights. Suppose the weights are fixed. Then clearly the covariance is zero. You don't have any ability to forecast. You're not trying to forecast. And so the only source of your profitability is the second component. The degree to which you are able to forecast future returns using your information, that's going to lead directly to profitability. And so we now have a measure of active versus passive for hedge funds. This is particularly relevant for hedge funds because there's no benchmark going on. We're not looking at active weights versus passive weights. We're looking at something much more elemental, much more basic, which is you make a decision at time t minus 1, how did it turn out next period? If the covariance is positive, you're going to add to your expected return. If the covariance is negative, you're going to subtract from that return. So this really provides a measure for looking at active versus passive. And here, I've just rewritten it using correlations of weights versus returns, as well as standard deviations. And the bottom line is that it allows us to decompose expected returns into these two pieces. Now, this seems so simple that when I first came upon it, I was kind of shocked. And I was surprised that nobody else had come up with it. 
In the literature, there are papers that touch upon this uh, to varying degrees. Grinblatt and Titman have a paper uh, that talk about this, and I cite that in, uh, in, in our paper. But they don't really focus on it as a measure of active versus passive investments. And it dawned on me as to why it is that in the past, uh, financial economists haven't really focused on correlations between weights and returns. And the reason is that, for the most part, financial econometrists are not really econometricians. They are actually focusing more on theory, and in particular, on portfolio optimization. What do we do in portfolio optimization? We try to pick weights that yield good outcomes. So in other words, we're thinking about omega not as random variables that have statistical properties, but we're thinking about the weights as choice variables that need to be optimized. So when you take the expectation of the returns, most of you, I suspect, if I hadn't written this down in this way, you would have taken the omega out of the expectation, and you would have had the expected return is equal to the sum of omega i times mu i. That's the standard equation that we all start with when we start doing mean variance optimization. But when you think about how hedge fund managers behave and the information that they use, and you look at it from an econometrician's point of view, oh, I've got portfolio weights here, I've got returns here, now I'm looking at their product. Well, in fact, they are statistical uh, measures that add to our understanding of active versus passive. So you can construct a simple ratio. The active ratio is simply the ratio of the covariance piece divided by the total return. And the interesting thing about this is that you can actually estimate this without ever having to compute a covariance. Because of the identity that I showed you before between the covariance and the expected returns, you can actually estimate this active ratio by taking 1 minus the ratio of the passive component divided by the total return. And the reason this is important is that hedge funds will almost never want to give you weights. They won't give you positions. But if you ask them to tell you, over the last year, on average, were you long or short equities? Were you long or short JGBs? Were you long or short gold? And if so, what was your average portfolio weight over that period? They'll possibly give you that. And once they give you that, you actually have enough to estimate how much of their return is due to active choices versus passive choices. And there are all sorts of things that you can do with this, obviously, once you have the information. Uh, but I want to illustrate to you just a few examples, because I think while it makes you know, perfect sense from uh, the perspective of um, uh, the decomposition, you, you should see it in action to get some intuition about it. Okay? So here's a very simple example that just goes to the heart of active versus passive. Suppose you've got uh, a, a very simple asset allocation strategy uh, between asset one and asset two. And let's suppose that asset one and asset two have returns that look like this. Asset uh, one has a return that looks like 1%, 2%, 1%, 2%, 1%. It basically just flips back and forth between 1% and 2%. And asset two is a risk-free rate that is 15 basis points per month. Okay? And now suppose that you engage in a very simple strategy where your portfolio weights look like this. The, the blue bar is that you're 75% in asset one, 25% in asset two. You basically uh, are holding that and the weights are constant. In this simple example, when you calculate the active ratio, obviously the active ratio is zero none of the return is due to any timing because you're not moving the weights and the, so the covariance between the weights and the returns is zero. What about in this case, now look at this. Your weights are low when the returns are low and your weights are high when the returns are high. So now you've got some ability to forecast when returns are high and low. In this case, you can see that the active ratio is actually positive. It's not 100% because a fair amount of your return happens to be coming from the fact that both of these assets are yielding positive return. So the fact is that there's passive, a passive strategy where you hold a constant portfolio will still generate something for you. 
but the active ratio will tell you what the incremental value is of your covariance. And finally, if you do the exact wrong thing, if you increase your portfolio when the returns are low and you decrease the portfolio when the returns are high, your active ratio is actually negative. You're actually doing worse than not nothing at all. So you, know, you can do a more sophisticated example where if you have some kind of a market timing strategy with an AR1, so the market, if the, if the market is an AR1 and you actually can time it, you can show that uh, this strategy has a positive active ratio. You can actually calculate it analytically. And in a, in a case where uh, you, we simulated um, a, a statistical arbitrage strategy, you can actually show that the active ratio separates out uh, the uh, active component from the passive. I want to say one last thing about this active ratio before we move on, which is that Warren Buffett versus Steve Cohn is a very important distinction because, as I said, they do things very differently, and yet I want to believe that there's some common element to both of their uh, investment talents. And the answer to whether or not there's any commonality has to do with the fact that you have to focus on the sampling interval. It turns out that Warren Buffett is making decisions all the time as well. It's just that his decisions most of the time is buy, 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 buy. Whereas Steve Cohen is buy, sell, buy some more, sell more, sell less, buy more, buy, sell. They both are making decisions, but they have different patterns, different time series patterns, because the underlying investments are different. So it turns out that the way to look at it is the different sampling intervals are giving you different results. Here's an example where your portfolio weights are changing as a function of your sampling interval. But in Warren Buffett's case, your portfolio weights may not be changing across a long sampling interval. That's OK. You'll still get an accurate estimator of what he's doing, even though the weights don't change as much. And the problem comes when, if your sampling interval is too coarse. So if you're measuring Steve Cohen's portfolio on a monthly basis, but he's making decisions every day, you could actually be missing out on a lot of what his investment talent is. So the one subtlety that you have to worry about is your active management has to be aligned. You have to have the sampling interval at least as fine as the decision-making intervals of the individuals that are uh, being analyzed. Okay. So um, there are some more examples, as I said, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, whoops, in the uh, text. And uh, let me now uh, skip to, whoops, uh, the empirical analysis where we look at a contrarian trading strategy. We do the uh, decomposition. I'll, I'll leave you to take a look at that. Um, so let me, uh, uh, make one final comment, which is when you extend the framework to having multiple factors driving your expected returns, and you now want to incorporate traditional investment management type of uh, performance uh, attribution, you can do that pretty easily with the active ratio, and you get a very interesting contrast to the traditional measures. Once you introduce these factors and you multiply out for the portfolio weights, you can show that performance comes from three different components. One is security selection, alpha. The second is your factor exposures, your betas. But the third, which people haven't talked about as much, is what I call factor timing. That is, is it the case that when you change your portfolio weights, that the portfolio weights you pick when multiplied by the betas, are actually going to be beneficial in terms of what those factor exposures are. So to be clear, as an example, Steve Cohen has been known to flip the beta of his portfolio from positive to negative overnight, which is a pretty remarkable achievement given that at, at the time that I heard about this, he was managing a $5 billion portfolio. To go from a positive to a negative beta with $5 billion overnight, that takes of both a lot of skill and a lot of guts. But the point is that if you want to know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for a hedge fund manager, the question to ask is, how good are your portfolio weighted betas 
relative to the subsequent performance of those factors. Is it the case that you flip to a negative beta when the risk premium turns negative, and you flip to a positive beta when the risk premium is positive? If so, you've got skill. That's a covariance measure between your weights and the betas. So the kind of active ratio applies just as well, uh, but it applies now between the covariances of those uh, asset-weighted betas, the, the weights times the betas and the factors. So that the uh, expected returns are the sum of three components, risk premia, security selection, and factor timing. Okay. Um, so uh, let me summarize by uh, uh, saying that uh, this framework allows you to uh, decompose hedge fund uh, returns into active management, which involves changing weights. You're making decisions, active bets. Uh, and this allows us to uh, come up with a concrete measure of those active bets, namely the correlation between weights and subsequent returns. And it does provide a somewhat new definition for active and passive. It's not just your weights uh, as a function of the benchmark, but rather the correlation of those uh, benchmark departures with subsequent returns. And uh, it provides a measure for um, a performance attribution that could give you information somewhat different from traditional measures. It may well be that this measure doesn't add a whole lot for traditional investments simply because traditional managers like mutual fund managers and long-only managers are highly constrained in how much they can vary their weights. Uh, but for absolute return investors, this could actually be a very useful measure. And in my view, this is the single most compelling argument for why it is that you would like to have a hedge fund manager actually give you information about his or her weights. Up until now, most investors who've asked for weights wouldn't know what to do with them because there's a lot of them and they move around a lot. Uh, but this is one example where once they give you the weights, or at least the average values over a period of time, you can actually see how much of the, manager is, uh, how much of the manager's return is being generated by changes in those weights versus simply holding on to risky high premium assets. So this brings me to my next topic which I'm going to just start talking about for a few minutes, and then maybe we'll take uh, the break at uh, 3 o'clock, and then we can reconvene at 3.30. The idea behind a hedge fund manager earning premia by holding on to certain risky assets is something that investors have been suspicious about for years. The notion of hedge fund beta uh, is a real controversial subject because, of course, hedge funds charge pretty high fees, and investors do not want to be paying 2 and 20 for beta. They can get beta on their own. Uh, and so if hedge funds are generating returns from beta, we want to know about it. The question is, what kind of beta might that be? And what I want to propose is that one of the most significant kinds of beta, which actually may not be so easy for individual investors to get on their own, is liquidity beta, illiquidity of hedge funds. That generates a risk premium that most of the time has a positive expected return. But every once in a while, you get your face ripped off, as we did in 2008. And so I want to talk about how we go about measuring illiquidity. Now, to give you an idea of hedge fund betas being uh, relevant, I start with a very simple illustration. Take a look at a long short equity fund and ask yourself the question, what are the biggest risk factors that affect long short equity? Well. Market beta, industry sector exposure, value growth, stock loan considerations, execution costs. Those are the things that a long short equity manager would worry about. Now, think about a fixed income arbitrage fund like LTCM. What would they care about? Yield curve exposure, credit exposure, liquidity exposure, leverage constraints, macro factors. What's interesting about this comparison is that there's virtually no overlap between these two funds. And what this suggests is that the kinds of risks that these funds exhibit can be very, very different. And in particular, as we know, they exhibit so-called phase-locking regimes, where there are periods where all of these funds tend to be highly correlated, typically when they're losing money, uh, and that there are nonlinearities in how quickly and how uh, uh, fast, uh, uh, how uh, uh, quickly they move and how fast they recover. So, let me give you a very simple example of, uh, about motivating the need for better risk models for uh, hedge funds. 
correlation is typically what we use to measure uh, these kinds of risks across these funds. And so I want to show you a simple calculation where you have a, a very, very uh, straightforward risk model for hedge fund returns that has a common factor. And you can think of the factor lambda as the S&P 500. But you also have a component that is a kind of tail risk. So this is a, a factor that has a common exposure Z. Uh, and uh, Z is normally distributed with some negative mean and a pretty big variance. So it's a big shock. But Z doesn't get switched on except very rarely. So there's an indicator variable that's zero most of the time. P is pretty high. But with small probability, it gets switched on. But when it does, it overwhelms the variability of returns. If you have a simple model like this, and you ask the question, what is the correlation between two hedge funds that have this kind of profile, what you see is that, obviously, when the uh, event does not occur, the correlation is close to zero. When the event does occur, the correlation can be very high, particularly if the variance of the uh, Z component is high. But what's frustrating is that if you calculate the unconditional correlation, so you don't know what regime you're in, whether I is equal to zero or one, when you calculate the unconditional correlation and you assume that, say, the probability of a bad event is one-tenth of 1%, but when it does occur, the volatility of Z is 10 times the volatility normally, it turns out that the unconditional correlation is basically 1%. So there's virtually no correlation unconditionally, despite the fact that when events happen, they're almost perfectly correlated. So this suggests that we need something a little bit more subtle and using a two-state regime switching model can actually capture that. So this is a simple Hamilton Markov switching model. Uh, and one of the things that you'll notice when you apply this to the data is that it has a really interesting um, fit for some of these hedge fund indexes. But for others, it, the, the maximum likelihood algorithm won't converge. So for example, for dedicated short selling, for risk arbitrage, for managed futures, using a two-state regime switching model just doesn't work. But for all of the others, it does. And it has a very interesting profile. Let's, for example, take fixed income arbitrage. The fixed income arbitrage uh, regime switching parameters says that you've got two different states for the mean, one where the mean is positive and the other where it's negative. And you've got two different states for the variability. One, where the variability is about 2%, and the other, where the variability is triple. So this gives you a sense of the kinds of differences in nonlinearities with that particular strategy. Most of the time, it's actually doing reasonably well. It's got a high mean, 9%, low standard deviation, 2%. If you take a look at that sharp ratio, you're getting a sharp ratio of close to 4.2 4 uh, in the good state. In the bad state, you get a negative sharp ratio that looks pretty unattractive. So this is one example, one illustration of how nonlinearities can characterize hedge fund returns. And by the way, this uh, regime switching model has a very interesting ability to pick out not just August 1998, but you see back in May of 1998 that the, the color coding tells you you're in a bad regime. So there were definitely early warning signs in terms of a regime shifting model of the dislocation that ultimately occurred with equity, uh, with uh, fixed income arbitrage uh, in August of 1998. Uh, there are a bunch of other ones that I'll let you take a look at, but the regime switching is really quite uh, a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, model. For managed futures, it's a horrible model. It doesn't work at all. And so here's an example of managed futures returns and the color coding, everything looks red because it always looks like there's a regime shifting, but, but you can't identify what they are. So what that's telling you is that the algorithm really hasn't converged. The parameter estimates are, are unreliable. Uh, it turns out that if you aggregate these regime shifting probabilities, you can actually get some indication of systemic risk. But that's just a bit of a preview that I'm going to come back to a little bit later on. Let me uh, uh, conclude uh, this part of the lecture by uh, saying that when we come back, I'm going to start talking about liquidity measures and how this autocorrelation that we detected in returns uh, in the previous table 
actually is going to be a very useful uh, litmus test for the kind of illiquidity exposure that we'll see in, uh, in these hedge funds and how we can use that to ultimately capture aspects of systemic risk that really uh, were visible uh, several years before the uh, crisis hit. Okay. So I want to continue uh, with a discussion of uh, illiquidity. We uh, saw from the uh, previous uh, tables that hedge fund returns have a peculiar characteristic in that many of them have very high serial correlation. And it turns out that serial correlation is going to be a key characteristic of illiquidity, uh, at least among hedge fund returns. Now, it's obviously difficult to talk about liquidity in the abstract. And as many people have said, liquidity is very much like pornography in the sense that it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. And the reason that it's hard to define is because liquidity really has three distinct characteristics, in my view. Something is liquid if you can sell it quickly if you can sell large amounts of it. And when you sell it, you don't move the price by very much. So that suggests that liquidity has these three dimensions of price, time, and size that are not always that easy to quantify. Now, we know that many hedge funds are not liquid. And there are two senses in which they're not liquid. One is that many hedge funds impose liquidity constraints on their investors. For example, you uh, can't put money in uh, at any point in time. Typically, there's a, a period of time monthly where you can subscribe. And more importantly, you can't take money out any time you want. There are often constraints on uh, when you can pull your money out. Uh, typically, investors are expected to leave their money in for at least one year. So there's a one-year lockup. Uh, and when you do withdraw, you typically are required to give 60 days notice, uh, or in some cases longer. And there are other hedge funds that impose what are called gates, meaning that when uh, more than 25% of the assets uh, are looking to be redeemed, they have the right to impose gates that say, no, you cannot withdraw. We will uh, liquidate in an orderly fashion over a much longer period of time uh, in that case. The second reason that liquidity affects hedge funds is because of the underlying assets that many hedge funds invest in. So those in hedge funds that invest in, say, emerging market debt or real estate or uh, natural resources like timber, they cannot liquidate those holdings very rapidly. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why they impose uh, these liquidity constraints on their investors. It turns out that a simple proxy for both of these aspects of illiquidity is serial correlation. And now the, the, to give you an example of this, let's take a look at those monthly indexes uh, that I showed you before, but now compare them to indexes uh, that are, um, are more familiar to us uh, from the traditional investment world. So in this table, you see the autocorrelations, row one, row two, row three, uh, of the standard uh, equity and bond indexes, Ibbotson, small stock index, long-term government bonds, uh, corporate bonds, large company index, and so on. And the serial correlations are generally pretty small, anywhere ranging from minus 2.3% uh, to 15% uh, uh, for the uh, Ibbotson uh, corporate bond and uh, small company indexes. But we see that for the AXP Extra Income Fund, which is a high yield debt fund, the autocorrelation is 35%. So right there, it seems like there may be some link between illiquidity uh, and autocorrelation. But as we saw before, when you look at the hedge fund indexes, the autocorrelations are really tremendous. Now, these are indexes, not uh, individual funds. But if you take a look at the convertible bond arbitrage index for the CS Tremont uh, family, you're getting a first order autocorrelation of 56%. Um, and even something like the fixed income arbitrage index has an autocorrelation of close to 40%. So clearly there's something going on. Now, uh, this is the example that I showed you before for individual mutual funds and hedge funds. And uh, one of the things you'll notice from the mutual funds uh, is that there are a few mutual funds that do have some serial correlation. Uh, for example, the Janus Worldwide Fund 
has the second highest autocorrelation with 11.4%. It turns out that the Janus Worldwide Fund, uh, I, I believe it's the, it may be either that or the Janus Fund, was involved in this mutual fund market timing uh, issue. It turns out that that market timing issue actually can generate, it can induce spurious serial correlation. So that's another example, stale prices, non-synchronous trading, which finance uh, people have studied uh, uh, for many years, that induces serial correlation uh, in portfolios. There's a relationship between that and illiquidity that I'll t talk about in just a minute. So in some research that uh, my co-authors, uh, Emila Gitmansky and Igor Makarov did, we tried to explain this serial correlation in hedge fund returns in a number of different ways. And we came up with five different reasons why you might have serial correlation. Time varying expected returns. Two, market inefficiencies. Three, non-synchronous trading. Four, illiquidity. Five, performance smoothing. And we spend a fair bit of time trying to use various different models to explain uh, serial correlation from the perspective of one and two. And we were just not able to do that. It's very difficult to have a model of time varying expected returns that's both plausible and can generate the amount of serial correlation on a monthly frequency. You know, it's possible to generate serial correlation with time varying expected returns over the course of quarters or years. But on a monthly basis, it's, it's really hard to calibrate a model that's plausible and that can generate the numbers that we see. Inefficiencies, we think, are even more unlikely because of the nature of these investments. Hedge funds are among the most active, aggressive, high-yielding, highly incentivized types of investments. So if anybody has an incentive to act smart, to take advantage of alpha or, or any predictability, it's hedge fund managers. So if you're getting a 40, 42% autocorrelation in mortgage-backed securities, you have a tremendous incentive to increase your leverage when you have a good return this month so as to benefit next month. And you have a tremendous incentive to decrease your leverage if you have a bad return this month so that you can reduce your losses next month. The only reason that you don't do that as a hedge fund manager is, in our view, if you can't do that, if you are actually physically unable to get in and out of positions actively because of illiquidity. So our uh, hypothesis uh, is that autocorrelation is a proxy for illiquidity as long as there are no other institutional rigidities that prevent you from trading. You know, if you're a, a mutual fund and you literally are not allowed to trade for specific regulatory reasons, then it may well be that inefficiencies persist because you're not allowed to take advantage of them. But in unregulated investment vehicles like hedge funds, the only reason that you're going to get autocorrelation, in our view, is if you cannot take advantage of any kind of serial correlation. So that's why we think illiquidity goes hand in hand with autocorrelation. Now, the third reason that we mentioned uh, a, a minute ago uh, was uh, smoothing. And this has to do with an activity that is, in fact, illegal. Investment smoothing, performance smoothing, is the simple uh, behavior where when you do well in a given month, you underreport your returns. And when you do poorly in a given month, you underreport your losses. So the idea is that you want to have a smoother set of returns so that the volatility is lower and the sharp ratio is higher. And there are some unscrupulous hedge fund managers that apparently engage in this activity in order to dress up their returns. Now the reason that in our paper and in this framework we don't distinguish between the two is because we can't. Uh, we can't tell whether or not smooth returns are coming because of the underlying illiquid nature of the assets or they're coming because managers are being sleazebags. But we would argue that actually for the purposes of illiquidity identification, it doesn't matter. In other words, the only way that an unscrupulous sleazebag hedge fund manager can smooth returns effectively, the only way that you can do that 
is if the assets are illiquid enough that you get to fiddle with their market valuations. So for example, if you're an um, equity market neutral manager, you're trading in exchange traded equities, your prices for the value of your securities are determined every second of the day. And in particular, if you use your closing prices to mark the daily returns, you don't have flexibility in choosing the mark that you pick to establish the value of your portfolio. If, on the other hand, you're investing in Manhattan real estate and you need to mark your portfolio to market daily, what is the value of 30 Rockefeller Center yesterday versus today? Uh, who, who knows? Uh, so there's a lot more flexibility when you're dealing with assets that are illiquid. And it's that flexibility that gives you uh, the kind of potential for fraud, for smoothing returns uh, that uh, you know, we uh, are describing. The bottom line is that whether it's deliberate or inadvertent, it's the illiquidity that gives you the opportunity for serial correlation. Now, I'll mention very briefly that return smoothing, this kind of idea of being uh, conservative in reporting your gains, uh, that sounds harmless. In fact, it sounds almost good uh, in the sense that if you do really well, you're not going to report all of it for fear that you may have to lose some of it later. Isn't that a good thing for investors to be conservative? Well, the answer is no. It's actually uh, potentially quite bad because it disadvantages different groups of investors. For example, those investors that are cashing out, they just happen to be cashing out at the end of the month. If you underreport your returns, you're basically cheating them of a portion of their gains. And you're advantaging the shareholders that are staying. On the other hand, if you underreport your losses, you're doing the opposite to those investors that are coming in. And so it has consequences. People lose and people gain. So one needs to be um, aware of that. Now, here's a, a more uh, a concrete illustration of the hypothesis that autocorrelation goes hand in hand with illiquidity. These are average first order autocorrelations for the monthly returns of individual hedge funds in the TAS live and graveyard databases from February 1977 to August 2004, averaged within categories. So the first category is convertible bond arbitrage. And the light blue uh, bar is the autocorrelation uh, of live funds. And the, um, uh, the red bars are the average autocorrelations for the dead funds. And um, you see that for convertible arbitrage, the average first auto autocorrelation across all the funds is close to 35%. That's pretty huge. And for funds of funds, multi-strategy, for event-driven, you're getting autocorrelations on average that's pretty high. However, if you look at the more liquid categories, categories that are known to involve strategies investing in very liquid securities, like what? Like, say, managed futures. Managed futures, by definition, are strategies where they invest in exchange-traded futures contracts, stock index futures, bond futures, commodity futures, and so on. Managed futures has a very low autocorrelation. Uh, similarly, global macro that invests in liquid securities, very liquid. Uh, equity market neutral, which is typically invested in exchange-traded equities, also among the lower ones. Uh, however, emerging markets, higher illiquid, and sure enough, you do get higher autocorrelation. The other interesting pattern that I want to comment from this table is situations where you look at the differences between live and dead funds. There are big differences in many of these cases. The autocorrelation, for example, uh, for multi-strategy for live is up close to 20%, but the autocorrelation for the dead funds is 6%. Now, that's an interesting phenomenon that I think has a very intuitive explanation, which is that funds that smooth returns, or funds that have smoother returns, are going to be the ones that tend to have better looking sharp ratios. They're the ones that will tend to be able to maintain assets. 
whereas the funds that uh, don't engage in that kind of smoothing or don't invest in those types of assets are going to be much more volatile and therefore more likely to go under. So that's a pretty clear manifestation of the impact of autocorrelation uh, on survival. Now, in a paper that um, uh, uh, my uh, two co-authors, uh, Mila Gitmansky and Igor Makarov, wrote, we try to model this uh, smoothness using a very simple uh, moving average process. So if you assume that the underlying returns of the hedge fund investment strategies are given by a simple one-factor model, but then you layer on top of this set of virtual returns a smoothing process, namely the observed or reported return is simply a moving average of the virtual returns over the last k periods, and you assume that the weights add up to one so that returns are neither being created nor destroyed, they're simply being redistributed to smooth it out, then you can actually show that smoothing returns leads to the kind of phenomenon that we expect. Namely, uh, the mean is unaffected, um, but the variance is reduced. Therefore, the sharp ratio is increased by a factor that's a function of the smoothing coefficients, uh, and that the covariances and autocovariances are actually biased. And you can actually quantify the degree of the bias. And so we actually estimate this for individual hedge funds and we show that the smoothing coefficients tend to be quite important for those hedge funds that are involved in the most illiquid of strategies. In fact, if you look at the um, smoothing coefficients, the, 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 the ones that are the most significant uh, among the various different styles in the database, you can see that a lot of the usual suspects uh, are, uh, are uh, present. Uh, these are by categories now. And uh, this shows you that among the categories, smoothing coefficients are the most important for the most illiquid strategies like fixed income arbitrage, uh, convertible bond arbitrage, uh, and so on. So there's a way that you can model illiquidity. If you can model illiquidity, if you can measure illiquidity, that means you can start to manage it. And so we've argued that now that you know how to measure illiquidity, now that there's a, a proxy for it, not a perfect proxy, but something that at least has, seems to have some intuitive appeal, you can now construct liquidity managed portfolios. So instead of optimizing mean and standard deviation, you can optimize mean standard deviation liquidity and get a kind of a mean standard, standard deviation liquidity frontier. So that's just an interesting application that comes out of the econometrics. Okay, now what I'd like to do is to turn from measures of liquidity to measures of systemic risk, of which liquidity will play an important role. Systemic risk is one of these uh, loaded terms, particularly lately, because it's been bandied about so much. And I want to start by explaining why I think hedge funds and systemic risk have something to do with each other. It actually is fairly obvious from what's happened in 1998. But since then, there have been many cases where hedge funds have created certain spillover effects that ultimately have some relationship to systemic risk. So what I'm going to try to argue here and show with some very basic uh, econometric analysis that systemic risk can actually be measured, at least in the hedge fund industry, it can be measured using these kinds of uh, liquidity characterizations. So what did we learn from 1998? The fact that liquidity and credit are critical to the macro economy and that they are multiplier accelerator effects associated with liquidity and credit even within the hedge fund world. In other words, the fact that hedge funds have access to certain kinds of credit gives them the ability to effectively create high-powered money and inject money into the economy simply through the means of leveraging their strategies. So to the extent that they have this ability, they also suffer from the consequences if liquidity is withdrawn very quickly. Now, in the banking sector, as we all know, the Fed exists to provide a buffer when banks hit liquidity shocks and to de deal with bank runs. We don't have the same facility among hedge funds. When a hedge fund like Bear Stearns runs into a kind of a, uh, a, 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 a bank panic, it's not a bank, at least it wasn't at the time, and so it wasn't able to uh, get uh, uh, liquidity from uh, the Fed. 
So, you know, uh, in some work that uh, I've done with um, uh, Mila uh, and uh, uh, other co-authors, we try to propose a number of measures of systemic risk. In particular, trying to measure liquidity of the hedge fund system uh, using various different kinds of risk models, uh, like the uh, regime switching model that I described before, and uh, some other measures that I won't uh, spend time going over here. What I'll do is just show you a little bit about how liquidity can actually be used as a kind of an early warning indicator for the type of dislocation that we saw. So um, to be very concrete about it, in October of 2004, there was an NBER conference that uh, Mark Carey and Renee Stoltz uh, hosted on the risks of financial institutions. And so we presented a paper titled Systemic Risk and Hedge Funds. And in that paper, we identified two themes that we saw among the various different measures that we came up with. One was that um, using these autocorrelation measures among individual hedge funds, we found that illiquidity was increasing substantially in the hedge fund industry. So let me give you an example of this. This is still from the 2004 uh, presentation. We looked at rolling window autocorrelations but where we calculated autocorrelations for individual hedge funds. And then we took a weighted average of those autocorrelations every month, where we weighted those autocorrelations by the assets under management of that hedge fund. So the hedge funds that were the biggest got the biggest weight in terms of their autocorrelation. And the, the blue mountain peaks uh, are those uh, weighted averages. Um, the yellow line is the median autocorrelation cross-sectionally among uh, those uh, hedge funds. And uh, the bottom light blue uh, bars are the number of hedge funds in the database. So the point of this is that in the early uh, parts of the database, um, the number of hedge funds was very small, so the estimates might be somewhat unreliable. But certainly within the last uh, you know, few uh, years, there are enough hedge funds that these uh, results are probably uh, reasonably stable. The point of this uh, rolling autocorrelation is that the weighted average shows that there was a tremendous buildup of illiquidity starting in 2003 and going up to 2004, up until the time we were measuring this, a large amount of illiquid hedge fund exposure. And it's not surprising, the hedge fund industry was growing quite a bit. LTCM turned out to be a tremendous boon for the industry because uh, I guess what they say is true, that it doesn't matter what people say about you, as long as they spell your name right, uh, it's good for you. So tremendous amounts of assets flowed into the hedge fund industry after 1998, and the, the strategies that attracted the most money were the ones that had the highest sharp ratios. The ones that had the highest sharp ratios also were the ones that were the most serially correlated. Not surprisingly, serial correlation means lower volatility, smoother returns, higher sharp ratio. And as a result, the amount of weighted autocorrelation was growing systematically uh, over this period of time. So that was one indicator that was telling us that there was some systemic risk building up. <clears throat> the other was our regime switching model. We looked at the regime switching probability of being in a high volatility, low mean state across each of the hedge fund categories. And this is the probabilities. We just added them up. Uh, they don't, their interpretation, there is no interpretation to the sum of the probabilities because the events are not independent. Uh, but just as an as a indicator of what the likelihood is for getting into a high vol, low mean regime, uh, again, towards 2004, the end of 2004, we were getting indications uh, that that was going to be a problem. And, and by the way, if you're wondering what this peak is, this was the bursting of the internet bubble. And if you're wondering what this peak was, uh, that was... Uh, 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 LTCM. So the indicators of distress using these simple econometric measures were all pointing in the same direction in 2004. The hedge fund industry had grown a lot. It had become more illiquid according to these strategy indicators. And the kind of volatility that we were seeing was growing. And the risk of low mean high volatility states was also growing. So at the end of that uh, presentation, based on these indicators, 
uh, Rene, you know, asked us to, to, you know, come to a conclusion. You know, he wanted us to, uh, you know, uh, make some kind of a, uh, of a statement as to how much risk we thought was in the system. And so, um, you know, we, we were hoping to hedge a bit, but, you know, we really didn't have that option. So we decided to use the uh, doomsday clock that I don't know how many of you are familiar with, but this is the, uh, this was put out by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, back in the 1940s um, to indicate how close we were to nuclear annihilation. So 1947, we were seven minutes to midnight. Uh, 1949, we were like three minutes to midnight uh, uh, with detente uh, and the um, other improvements in relations. We were like, you know, 11 minutes to midnight. Here's nine. So at the end, we thought, why don't we try to say how many minutes to midnight we thought we would be at, in 2004. And so this is a slide that was the last slide in our deck uh, in 2004. We said we are 15 minutes to midnight from a truly systemic shock in the hedge fund industry. And you know, over the course of the next couple of years, we had you know, other papers that we wrote that said we were getting closer and closer. Um, and in 2005, in particular, we pointed out that um, the hedge fund industry had moved even closer to some kind of systemic shock because we noticed another big increase in illiquidity during the first half of 2005. So uh, the New York Times actually published an article in September of 2005 uh, where they featured our paper. And uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the paragraph at the very end, which I blew up here for you, I, I can't resist, um, the, the reporter said, the nightmare script for uh, Mr. Lowe would be a series of collapses of highly leveraged hedge funds that bring down the major banks or brokerage firms that lend to them. Now, this was in September 2005, and when it came out, we, we got a couple of calls from friends on Wall Street that said, are you nuts? You think that hedge funds coming down could actually bring down broker-dealers? You're crazy. And yet, you know, the evidence, the econometric evidence was actually pretty clear that uh, the exposures were fairly large. Now, in, in fact, it was kind of ironic because around that same time, there was an industry publication that came out that directly contradicted our conclusions. It was the Counterparty Risk Management Working Group uh, that was put together by a number of the most prestigious um, firms in the industry. And in their introduction, this came out in July, so it was just two months before that New York Times article. Uh, in, their con in their introduction, this, uh, this uh, report uh, said, in approaching its task, the policy group shared a broad consensus that the already low statistical probabilities of the occurrence of truly systemic financial shocks had further declined over time. And we had no idea how they were able to uh, ascertain that because all of the indicators that we looked at suggested the, that the uh, probabilities were increasing. Um, and we, we noted with some uh, humor that in that same report, they also pointed out, you know, two observations that we thought were pretty obviously contradictory to their conclusions, which is that to cope with serious back office and potential settlement problems in the credit default swap market, that was one of the issues that a lot of these firms didn't even know what their risks were because they hadn't caught up on the paperwork of all the credit default swaps that they had written in the years prior. And secondly, they also pointed out that the practice of being able to assign your leg of these swaps without prior permission so the assignment issue was a tremendous uh, problem in not knowing who your counterparties were. So these things suggested to us that the business was growing a lot faster than it should have been. And again, this was also part of the econometric evidence. By the way, the, uh, the, the companies that were part of that counterparty risk management working group, they're listed here. Uh, the firms that are in red uh, blew up or had to be acquired. The firms in blue had to be bailed out. So it was just kind of a you know, poetic justice. Um, given what their conclusions were. So how do you deal with that? How do you measure systemic risk um, uh, in a somewhat more direct fashion apart from this illiquidity measure? Well, in some recent work that, that we've been doing, we propose to use a very simple idea that comes from the time series literature, Granger causality tests. Uh, if you recall, a Granger causality relationship is a relationship where uh, a particular variable uh, can predict another variable in the future, but not vice versa. So for example, uh, X is said to Granger cause Y if X can predict future Y, but uh, 
it cannot, uh, Y cannot predict future X. So there's a unidirectional relationship. If it's bidirectional, then there's just feedback between the two or simultaneity. But Granger causality can be quantified into, by using regressions of variables uh, run against their own lags as well as lags of other time series. And a relationship of Granger causality has to do with whether or not the off-diagonal elements are non-zero. So you can use a Granger causality test to see whether or not there are relationships among different financial institutions, uh, particularly if they happen to be publicly traded, and get a sense of how connected the system is. So one way to capture systemic risk is to simply measure the Granger causality relationships among hedge funds, banks, broker dealers, and insurance companies. And you basically run these regressions on a rolling window basis every month. And you measure the various different uh, levels of statistical significance. And when you plot them, you get this kind of a network. Now, I have to explain to you a little bit about the nomenclature. So uh, the different colors represent the different uh, industries. So uh, green is for hedge funds, uh, blue is for banks, red is for broker dealers, and black is uh, for uh, insurance companies. These are all publicly traded firms with the exception of hedge funds, which are obviously private uh, investment uh, vehicles. And these lines represent statistically significant relationships at the 5% level of Granger causality between one entity and another. So when you see a green line going to a black dot, a black name here, what that's saying is that there's a significant Granger causal relationship between a hedge fund last month and an insurance company this month. So if you see a lot of green, a lot of green lines, that's saying that there's a lot of Granger causality from that industry. If a lot of those lines are converging onto one point, there, that means that there's a lot of Granger causality to that one entity. If, on the other hand, you see a lot of lines emanating from one point, that says that there's one firm that is Granger causing a lot of other firms. So anyway, this is the picture as of uh, the five-year window from January 1994 to uh, December 1996. Uh, this is what it looked like from 19, January 19, uh, 2006 to December 2008. So quite a bit of a difference, right? From 94 to 96 and 2006 to 2008. A three-year rolling window, sorry. I think I said five years. It's a three-year rolling window. And if you look at this from various different periods, uh, you'll notice that you get some very big changes in the network. In fact, we, um, we decided to make a little movie of this. Um, uh, and so I don't know if this will play here. Can you see it? Um, there's a, whoops. Where is this now? I thought there was a, it's playing. Ah, here it is. Yeah, so this is just illustrating how the movie uh, is made by looking at the various different uh, periods. But then, you know, as you play it over time, you see that there's actually quite a bit of change in this network. There are periods where there are strong relationships. That was an example where uh, there was a lot of, of causality from a small number of institutions. This is not much is going on. Here you can see yeah, one firm getting impacted by lots of different firms. And uh, sorry about the music. We got to do something to make this uh, interesting. So what you see over time is that uh, the network actually changes quite a bit. And in particular, it changes a lot as you get closer to the uh, latter part of the sample. There are some very clear points of uh, concentration among uh, certain broker dealers. AIG shows up prominently here. Um, a number of the largest investment banks show up, of course, Citigroup, JP Morgan. 
Uh, but the patterns actually change as a function of market conditions. And so the question is whether using this, uh, yeah, this is now uh, LTCM and uh, the internet bubble together, and you can see some really strong relationships among the various different uh, entities. So let me uh, stop this. Okay, uh, we're not gonna win an Oscar for that, but uh, um, the point is that um, using these networks, we think we can actually deduce certain kinds of relationships. And you can actually see the names of the relationships that have the most significant network uh, connections among the various different entities, uh, many of which were uh, institutions that got affected. And you can see them in, in a couple of cases uh, years before uh, the, uh, the crisis actually built. Okay, so for the, um, the, the last part of this talk, what I want to do is to turn to uh, specific examples of financial crises. Uh, in particular, August 1998, August 2007, May of 2010. And I want to show how econometric methods can actually be used to deduce certain kinds of systemic shocks where you might not think uh, they would be particularly helpful. And um, the references here are some papers that I wrote with uh, my co-author, Amir Kandani, but also uh, a paper that you can get online from a, a, a high-frequency broker-dealer named Nanex about the flash crash in May 2010. Let me start with uh, August of 2007, because I think that is something that uh, a number of you probably uh, have heard about and remember. That was a strange month where during the middle of the month, uh, there was something that ultimately people referred to as the quant crisis or the quant meltdown. And what they were referring to was that during the second week of August, which probably none of you remember, during the second week of August, all of these quantitative hedge funds, particularly equity market neutral or stat arb hedge funds, they all lost money at the same time. And it became so uh, prominent and significant that the Wall Street Journal actually wrote an article about this, a front page article on September 7th, how market turmoil waylaid the quants. And they mentioned a number of, of hedge funds and prop trading desks, including uh, Morgan Stanley. And specifically what happened? What happened was during August 7th, 8th, and 9th, the three days in the second week of August, huge losses uh, uh, occurred among a very small group of very specialized hedge funds. And the strange thing is nobody knew why. I mean, typically when a hedge fund loses money, you know why. So when LTCM lost money in August of 1998, we knew why. Credit spreads widened. And you know, when the internet bubble burst, lots of hedge funds lost money because they were invested in internet stocks. Internet stocks went down. If you were to ask, why did quantitative equity market neutral funds lost money in the second week of August, you couldn't actually put your finger on anything. I mean, stocks moved up, stocks moved down, they moved left, right. I mean, you know, there was no obvious pattern. And the problem is that it's hard to figure out because they weren't talking. So sometime by the third week of August, I had heard about this from some of my former students uh, and colleagues that were in the industry. And so I called a few of them up and I said, what's going on? You know, why, are these, why, why are you losing money? And uh, they said, look, I, I, I can't say anything. But even if I could say anything, I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> so. That tells you that there was something really strange about what was happening in that day. And so uh, my student at the time, Amir Kandani, and I uh, thought that, you know, we want to figure out what happened, but we obviously can't do that without the data for these hedge funds. So let's do something that is close, which is let's simulate a very simple strategy uh, that hedge funds like these might be using. And so we went to the literature and looked at a very simple strategy that was used by uh, Bruce Lehman uh, and uh, myself and Craig McKinley in uh, two separate papers, which is a very simple mean reversion strategy. This is a strategy that basically looks at the returns of a particular stock K days ago and compares it to the average return of stocks on that day. And if that return was greater than the average, then today we would short it. 
And if on that day, k days ago, it was less, then we would buy it today. So effectively, what the strategy does is to uh, buy the losers from k days ago and sell the winners from k days ago. It's essentially a mean reversion strategy. And um, so the actual strategy is given here. The portfolio weights omega it is minus 1 over n times the return on i k days ago minus the average return across all stocks k days ago. And if you look at the way we structured that, and you take the sum of those weights, they add up to 0. So you can think of these not necessarily as fractions, but you can think of them as actually dollar investments. It doesn't matter. Scale is irrelevant since the sum is equal to 0. So this is a market neutral investment. And in order to compute the return, you have to get a sense of the scale. And so the scale of this investment is simply the absolute value of the weights divided by 2. That's like the dollar amount, long and short. They equal the same thing. So that's why you have to divide by 2. You're double counting otherwise. And so the rate of return of this uh, equity market neutral strategy is simply the portfolio weights multiplied by the return. You can think of this as the dollar profit divided by the amount that you're long or short. Okay. So that's the calculation that we did. The one thing that we had to worry about was leverage. And um, the reason that, uh, I'll, I'll come to leverage in a minute, but the reason that we used the strategy was because it's very simple to compute the profit of the strategy. And in particular, when you calculate the expected value of the profit, it turns out to be a function of the means, standard deviations, and the covariances and auto covariances of the returns. So it's a very nice. Uh, kind of a, a microscope to use to look at what's been going on because you can calculate the moments of the expected profits as a function of the time series properties of the uh, underlying returns. So let me show you the historical performance of this strategy. It's a very simple strategy. We applied it to uh, the top 1,500 stocks on a daily basis, uh, and we use k equal to 1. So we're looking at mean reversion relative to yesterday's returns. These are the average daily returns of the strategy applied to all the stocks in that 1,500 stock universe, as well as to the various different deciles from smallest to largest. And we break down the average return on a daily basis year by year from 1995 to 2007. And let's just start with the uh, 1995 return. The 1995 return is 1.38% per day. That is a big return, right? Because you've got to multiply by 252 to figure out what the average annual return is. That's a big return. Now, I don't want to focus on the, the, the level of the return. It's obviously unrealistic because we have not deducted transactions costs or other market frictions. Uh, and you know, can you literally trade 1,500 stocks every day? It's very hard. There's lots of issues. But what I want to point out is that um, this is a, a, a very consistent strategy in the sense that if you look at the annual averages across all the years, they're all positive, but they're declining monotonically, with maybe one exception. Virtually every year, year after year, the returns are going down, 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 until the very last year of our simulation, you're getting an average daily return of about 13 basis points. Now, 13 basis points is still pretty attractive, right? That's still like 30% return a year. But it's much less than 138 basis points. Now, what about risk? Well, if you calculate the daily standard deviation of the strategy, let's do that. The daily standard deviation starts out in 1995 at 40 basis points. 40 basis point daily standard deviation versus 138 basis point daily average return gives you a daily sharp ratio uh, of about 3, which when you multiply by the square root of 252, let's call it 256, so it's 16, 16 times 3, you're getting an annualized sharp ratio in excess of 45. It's, it's a big number, right? So clearly unrealistic. It's not meant to be realistic. Although, actually, in a minute, I'm going to argue that there are some realistic elements to it that, um, that many hedge funds took advantage of during that time. But anyway, uh, 
this shows you that the risk is 40 basis points. And you know, the risk actually moves around a bit. But in the very last year, the risk was at 72 basis points. The year prior, 2006, it was at 52 basis points. So we're almost there now in terms of being able to simulate the performance of this strategy during August uh, 2007. The one final feature that I want to talk about is this idea of profitability versus assets under management. In this graph, I simply display the uh, average profitability year by year of that strategy. And as we saw, it started out uh, being very profitable at 138 basis points per day, but by 2007, it went down to 13 basis points per day. So pretty significant and smooth decline in profitability, not surprisingly. What I've displayed in the blue bars, as well as the red bars, is the assets under management in the TAS hedge fund database in the categories equity market neutral and uh, long short equity. And what this shows is that during this period where this strategy continued to lose value, assets were flowing into strategies like this. Now, how does that make sense? How could it be? Why would investors be putting money into this thing if it's becoming less profitable? Well, actually, one argument you could make is that the reason it's less profitable is because people are putting more money into it. That's certainly a factor. But nevertheless, how could investors be so stupid to be putting money here after the strategy had declined so much in value over here? Why would you, you know, a year or two later, continue to put more money into the strategy? And the answer is leverage. These are the strategy returns without leverage. But what if you were to enhance those returns by leveraging them? And so let me just explain to you how leverage works. Most of you probably already know this, but for the sake of uh, those who may not, the typical hedge fund in this category engages in a matched book on the long and short side, meaning that for $100 million of capital, they typically take $100 million of long positions coupled with $100 million of short positions. So their net positions nets out to zero, but for regulatory purposes, that's not their leverage. The way you calculate leverage is take the absolute value of those positions, add them together, divide by the amount of equity, and that's your leverage. So in the very top example, the leverage is two to one. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture, hedge funds can leverage far greater than two to one. So for example, a number of hedge funds during this time period were able to, with $100 million of capital, take positions on the order of $500 million long and $500 million short. That's 10 to one leverage for these kinds of funds. And so in general, when hedge funds leverage theta to one, they're basically able to multiply their returns by theta over two. You multiply the actual returns by that, which means you multiply the mean, but you also multiply the variance. Increased risk and expected return. So the question that we asked in our calculation is, how much leverage would a hedge fund have to deploy in 2007 in order to achieve the same level of expected return that it enjoyed in 1998? And the answer is pretty simple. In 1998, and in a few minutes, I'll explain why I picked that as the base year. In 1998, the average daily return for this simulated strategy was about 50 basis points per day. And let's assume that the return multiplier is 1. That's the base year, all right? Well, if it turns out that we look at 2007, where the expected return is 13 basis points, we would need leverage of 8.96 in order to multiply the returns by 4.48 to yield 5, 0.57. In other words, you would need leverage of close to 9 to 1 in order to get the same expected return as you enjoyed in 1998 with no leverage. So what we decided to do was to assume 8 to 1 leverage, because that was what it was in the prior year. So going into 2007, you said, how much leverage do I need to get to my 
level of expected return in 1998, it's 8 to 1 leverage. So with 8 to 1 leverage, what did this strategy look like in terms of its statistical properties in 2007? With 8 to 1 leverage, you're multiplying by returns by 4. So that means that starting in the beginning of 2007, where these were your statistics, your expected return was 60 basis points per day with a volatility of 200 basis points per day. Okay? That's, that's your profile going into 2007. The reason that I'm telling you all this is I, I want to set you up to understand how tumultuous that second week of August was for these managers. Going into this year, you have a strategy that on average earns you 60 basis points a day and on average has volatility of about 200 basis points. Okay? Now, let's see what happened in August. So this simulates the daily returns of that very simple strategy going into you know, end of July, beginning of August. So these are the daily returns. And what's marked in blue are August 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. And let's see what happened. First of all, at the end of the month, you actually did quite well. 60 basis points is your expected rate of return per day. But on July 30th and 31st, you earned 177 basis points and 146 basis points. Of course, you know, on August the 2nd, you lost 122 basis points. Uh, but on the other hand, on August 6th, you made 200 basis points. So your, your returns are whipping around pretty good. August 7th, Tuesday, you lose 464 basis points, 4.6%. That's more than two standard deviations. Now, as we all know, a two standard deviation event happens roughly once out of every 20 days, right? 5%. So two sigma event is certainly something that will get your attention, but it's not a problem until you reach August 8th, which is now another event, but this time it's closer to a four or five sigma event. You now, on August 8th, with this strategy, have lost 11%. That is big. That is a big event, um, particularly after having lost 4.6% the day before. And what was really bizarre about these two days is that when you look at all of the various different indexes, nothing weird was going on. For example, let's take a look. On Tuesday, August the 7th, the S&P 500 was actually up 62 basis points. The S&P small cap index was up 71 basis points. The MSCI emerging markets index was up 45 basis points. If you look at the VIX, the VIX went down on that Tuesday. So across all of these indicators, there was nothing, nothing weird. You couldn't identify any one thing that would cause these losses. So you're a manager, you just lost two standard deviations yesterday, and now today you've lost four standard deviations. That's a really rare event. That's got your attention. And then on Thursday, August 9th, you lose another four standard deviations. Within three days, you have lost 25% of your capital. A quarter of your assets have been wiped out and you don't know why. There's no reason for it. And you know, I, I remember uh, at the time, in the aftermath, the Goldman Sachs chief financial officer, David Veneer, he was cited as saying that this was a really tumultuous period for us because you know, we, we, we had a 25 sigma event occur. Now, I realize that he's not a statistician, but Frankly, nobody should ever be allowed to say that a 25 sigma event occurred, right? Because the last time that occurred was sometime during the Cretaceous period. And it, it's, it's obviously you've got the sigma wrong. Uh, but in any case, using that basis of 200 basis points, a really big set of events occurred during those three days, August 7th, 8th, and 9th, and nobody understood it. Now, what was even more frustrating was along the way, because these managers presumably had no idea what was going on, what would your natural inclination be? When you lose 
two sigma and then another four sigma, and you don't know why, your natural inclination is to take some risk off the table, right? Cut risk. That's the responsible thing to do. Reduce your exposures. So managers did that. They reduced their exposures, and in doing so, probably caused more of the losses on that Thursday. But then they reduced exposures even more. And what happened on Friday? On Friday, this strategy posted a 23.67% gain. It actually flipped back. There was a reversal now of extraordinary magnitude. This is like 12 standard deviation reversal. Of course, when you go down by 25% and you go up by 25%, you don't get back to zero, do you? I remember when I was in high school, I uh, sat in on an uh, economics class being taught at Queens College, and um, the uh, instructor, a uh, graduate student, was giving a numerical example to the class saying that you know, it was GDP going down by 10% from 100 to 90, and later on in the example she said it would uh, go up by 10% from 90 to 99. And somebody in the class said, excuse me, professor, uh, why is it the case that when you go down by 10% and you go up by 10%, you don't get back to 100? She thought about it for a minute and she said, well, you know, economics is an inexact science. So. <laughs> and I always remember that. The fact is that you didn't get back to even because you cut risk. And even if you didn't cut risk, you wouldn't get back to even. So a number of managers locked in their losses at this point. And it was an incredibly frustrating and tumultuous period, particularly because of what was going on in markets. Now, there's a hint at what might have been going on starting Thursday, August 9th. On Thursday, August 9th, look what happens to the S&P. The S&P now drops by almost 3% in one day. That's a big move for the S&P. And the VIX shoots up by five points in that one day. Now, what's not displayed here is the LIBOR OIS spread. It turns out that right around now is when that spread blows out. And then on the evening of August 9th and into August 10th, that's when the central banks across the world decide to inject massive amounts of liquidity into the system. But it had nothing to do with equities, right? I mean, equities are just equities. And yet, somehow, equity market neutral managers were feeling it. The ripple effects were tremendous. Now, the last thing I want to make before I propose a, a conjecture, because we don't know, in fact, what happened, but we have a conjecture. The last thing I want to do is to take a look at the same strategy back in August of 1998. Let's compare what happened uh, in 2007 with 98, because during 98, we also had a credit crisis, right? August 17th was when Russia defaulted on its uh, GKO uh, government bonds. And on August 17th, 1998, this same strategy generated a return of 96 basis points, positive. Uh, August 21st, when uh, LTCM uh, reported a loss of $600 million to their portfolio, a one-day loss of $600 million, back when $600 million really meant something, uh, on that day, this strategy produced a return of positive 1.04%. On September the 3rd, when LTCM uh, sent out their investor letter saying that they might actually not be able to uh, uh, maintain their positions and may have to liquidate, on that day, this strategy produced a return of positive 1.41%. And on September 24th, 1998, when the bailout of LTCM was announced, on that day, this strategy produced a positive return of 1.21%. In other words, during August of 1998, when we had what seemed like a really serious and very similar credit crisis, a flight to quality, a global flight to quality, equity markets couldn't care less, or certainly this strategy couldn't care less in the sense of not showing any kind of dislocation whatsoever. In fact, it was quite a profitable period for this type of strategy. OK, so now let me take all of these observations and try to weave them together into some kind of, of conjecture. And this is the conjecture that, that we came up with. 
we propose that in August of 2007, we had a situation where equity market neutral funds were being unwound. That is, their positions were being liquidated for some reason. Most likely the reason was because some investors or portfolio managers needed to raise cash. And they needed to raise it quickly, which means that they were going to try to sell the thing that was the most easy to sell, namely the liquid exchange traded uh, assets. Those unwindings caused the losses initially. And those losses then caused other funds that were not trying to liquidate to reduce their exposures and unwind as well. And this unwinding process became a positive feedback loop that ultimately cascaded into large losses that then long short managers as well as long only managers started to respond to and, and unwound more. And by Friday, August the 10th, the unwinding was done. The pressure to liquidate was finished. And markets rebounded because there was no fundamental information that was causing these market price changes. It was really due to the price pressure of the unwinding. Once the pressure is removed, the prices swing back. And the Friday rebound was consistent with the fact that this was an unwinding, not an information-based trade. So there are a number of lessons that we draw from this. But before I talk about that, let me show you a little bit of further analysis. What if we looked a little bit deeper, not just into this very simple strategy, but rather let's look at long short portfolios that are formed using certain uh, accounting factors, valuation factors that investors uh, might be using. So we look at a variety of different factors, five of them, book to market, earnings to price, cash flows to price, price momentum, and earnings momentum. We rank the S&P 1500 stocks monthly by these factors. And then we basically invest a dollar long in the highest decile and short the lowest decile to get the usual you know, long short portfolios and simulate the returns of those strategies. If you do that from the beginning of 2007 to the end using daily data, what you notice is a very interesting pattern. Starting in the beginning of July, you notice a systematic decline of factors uh, of one sort and a systematic increase of factors of another sort. So the momentum factors are going up, and the various relative value and valuation factors are going down. One interpretation of that is that the particular portfolios that were constructed with those factors in mind were being liquidated systematically during the course of the month. And anecdotally, we've asked uh, portfolio managers in this space, is it true that you were liquidating during the month of July? And they all said to us, yeah, we were, because risk was increasing because of the subprime crisis. Bear Stearns had happened earlier on that year. We were worried going into the second half of the year, and we wanted to cut back our risk. So we started liquidating our positions beginning of July. Little by little, we started unwinding. And you notice that the beginning of August, there's an even bigger blip, as if something happened during that first and second week. And uh, so we decided to look at even intraday what was going on. We got tick data from the New York Stock Exchange for the uh, months of July, August, and September. And we simulated a very simple market-making strategy. Actually, we used the, the factors, the five factors, intraday. And so we were able to show that intraday, you had these liquidations going on. But we did something a little bit more generic. We wanted to know what happened to market-making during August 2007. So we simulated a very, very simple mean reversion strategy uh, in winners and losers using tick data over the course of uh, five-minute returns, 10-minute returns, 20-minute returns, and so on. And we asked the question, what was the profitability of these market-making strategies during these various intervals? And so here's a, a graph of starting with the month of July, the beginning of July, 
uh, going through the end of September. And what I'm going to show you is the cumulative profits from mean reversion strategies at various different holding periods. So for example, this is the cumulative profit of a one hour mean reversion strategy. So every hour you, you buy losers of the previous hour and you uh, short sell the winners from the previous hour uh, as a way of doing a proxy for market making. And the red lines indicate that second week of August, August 6th through uh, 10th. Um, and you can see that um, for the most part, other than a little bit of a dip here, uh, you're making money uh, in this hourly mean reversion strategy. It's positively sloped. Okay. Now let's take a look at a higher frequency strategy, half an hour. Half an hour, eh, you're also making money, but not much more or less than the one hour. How about 15 minutes? 15 minutes, you're actually making more money. The slope is greater, but you've got a bigger dip. You've lost money, actually, during that week of August, and uh, you've started recovering afterwards. How about 10 minutes? And how about five minutes? The five-minute return is really where things get interesting. Look at what happens to the strategy. First of all, the strategy's got a positive slope, so it's very profitable. Five-minute mean reversion makes money throughout July, throughout the beginning of August, up until the first day of August. And then it's flat and slightly negative. And then it's negative throughout the week, and even going into the next week, and then it recovers, and it goes on its merry way, continuing to be profitable every day. So looking at this, we have a conjecture about what might have happened during that second week of August. The narrative that we've developed is that during the month of July, there was general unwinding of these strategies. Uh, the unwinding picked up in the beginning of August for a variety of reasons, not the least of which could be that uh, the, the returns uh, of these hedge funds were computed during that first week of August. And it may be that they triggered some kinds of uh, credit issues that had to be dealt with and further unwindings had to occur. In any case, during that second week of August, during the first day, the profits actually were stable and level and declined. Now, if you're a high frequency market maker and you're making money every single day for the last month and all of a sudden on one day you lose money, that's significant. So what would you do as a market maker with this kind of a profile? The natural thing to do is to pull back your capital if you can. A New York Stock Exchange specialist is not allowed to do that. As an NYSE specialist, you are obligated, you are a designated market maker. So you cannot not trade with the public when the public wants to trade. But as a high frequency hedge fund, you can. And over the last 10 years, a lot more of the market making capital, a lot more of the liquidity is being provided by high frequency prop desks and hedge funds. So we conjecture that after these initial losses, the high frequency guys just decided, I'm not playing anymore. I'm out of the game. I'm going to sit out until my systems start working again. This, we conjecture, has the effect of one party of a seesaw getting off without letting the other party know. And so when the market makers all of a sudden disappear, and now the usual suspects go to trade and unwind their portfolio, what they find is that they're stepping into a much deeper hole than they did before. You get a, an air pocket, a big drop in prices, uh, and so you get this kind of a phenomenon. But once the unwindings are over, the market makers come back and they become perfectly profitable yet again. So there are lots of other uh, pieces of evidence that seem to suggest uh, this kind of phenomenon did occur. Uh, it's all indirect evidence, though. We don't have any direct knowledge because there's no way to get information at this point, uh, only through these simulations. But what it suggests is an intriguing uh, potential explanation for what happened now uh, in May of 2010. Uh, there are some important differences, though, so I want to make sure that uh, we don't get the impression that the, the events were the same. But the idea of high-frequency strategies becoming more and more important 
uh, in market dynamics, I think that's the common theme between the two. And so using these kinds of econometric decompositions, I think that we can actually come up with some useful uh, guidelines for how we think about systemic risk. So let me uh, wrap this up, and I'm going to leave some extra time uh, for uh, Q&A and discussion. There are lots of topics for future research um, in financial econometrics that uh, the hedge fund industry, I think, naturally suggest. Time-varying parameter, uh, estimates of hedge fund returns, dynamic correlations, rare events, how to model funding risk, leverage, and market dislocation, welfare implications of hedge funds. You know, do they really provide a valuable social service in all of the liquidity that they inject? Uh, and then finally, the industrial organization of the hedge fund industry. Uh, does that leave any room for improvement given the uh, perverse incentives that seem to be uh, created with some of the contracts? Um, let me conclude with a little bit of, uh, uh, of an overview about the current trends in the industry. As I mentioned at the very start, the hedge fund industry is very dynamic. And it has already reinvented itself over the last three years, thanks to the financial crisis. Assets are getting near an all-time high yet again, and they're growing. And for reasons that we discussed, we think that uh, they're going to grow even more over the course of the next few years. And um, the, re the registration process will almost surely uh, be part of uh, the new regulatory reform bill. Uh, and the hedge funds will likely have to provide a lot more disclosure. Also, as part of the new reform bill, uh, which was passed uh, just uh, yesterday, the, there is going to be a creation of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is going to be the heads of all of the financial regulatory agencies, and also the creation of the Office of Financial Research, which as part of Treasury will be responsible for collecting and managing all of the data in the financial industry. So this is something that I think is going to be of tremendous value and importance. And hopefully the NBER will play a big role in helping the OFR because of the experience of the NBER in dealing with this data and the research. If the Volcker rule um, gets implemented the way that it's been written, a lot more hedge funds are going to be created because institutions will now have to get rid of their prop trading desks and other uh, uh, types of hedge fund activities so that they will be walled off and in hedge funds. And as a result, I think the hedge fund industry is going to become even larger and more important um, as it responds to this uh, uh, financial regulatory reform. So that suggests that there's going to be a lot more opportunities for academics and financial econometricians, uh, and that the hedge fund industry will continue to pose really interesting research questions uh, that um, I think we'll uh, be able to answer over the next few years. Thank you, and uh, let me stop here.